Uh, it's about 6.05 right now. Uh, my name is Will Atkinson. I'm the Director of Planning for the Record. Thank you for everybody attending tonight, citizens included as well. Uh, the first half of this meeting is going to be an hour and a half of a, a discussion at the end uh, from Verdunity uh, with a presentation about uh, their focus with a comprehensive plan. And here in just a minute or so, we're going to invite uh, Kevin Shepard up uh, to do the presentation. Um, uh, we are asking that if you have any questions or any thoughts and what have you, uh, please uh, keep them for the end of the first hour and a half. Um, and if you feel free to take notes. And, and what have you. So, um, Kevin, if you don't mind. All right, let's uh, <clears throat> see if we can get this going and um, answer some questions for you guys. Hopefully, open some eyes, inform you guys a little bit, answer some questions. As Will said, my name is Kevin Shepard. I'm a founder and CEO of Verdunity. We are a Texas based community consulting firm uh, that prioritizes fiscal sustainability in everything that we do. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons I think our firm was tasked with looking at your comprehensive plan is the community's emphasis um, on uh, fiscal sustainability and wanting to um, take some of these concepts and drive that through the land use plan and some of the other things that, that come out of the comprehensive plan effort. Um, just to reinforce a couple things or build on a couple things that, that Will said, I've got this first presentation is going to be roughly 45 minutes. Might go a little longer, might be a little shorter every time I do it. Don't really know. So, um, but roughly 45 minutes is what we're shooting for, and then we've got another 30 to 45 minutes to get questions. We're going to focus this first part on feedback and, and questions from the community. So, you all that, that are here, I don't know how um, the Ring Central works with questions from the community. If we have people watching remotely, can we do that, Will? Yes, we. Yeah, we're, the, between uh, Rachel and I, we are keeping an eye on. Okay. Okay. So, as I'm going through this here, if you um, AJ, just to introduce the rest of our team real quick so you know who's who. We've got AJ Favre. She's our project manager over there. Um, we've got Karina Castillo. And then where'd Marshall? Oh, and then Marshall Hines. Marshall's moseying around taking photos. Um, if you would like to have one or two index cards to write some questions on um, as we go, we've got some over there for you. Um, I know sometimes as you're listening to something, you might have a question like right in the middle of the presentation. So if you want, uh, if you want an index card, raise your hand. AJ or, or Karina, one of them can bring that to you. you got notes perfect um, so yeah just um, I'll be able to get through this quicker usually most of your questions are going to get answered or at least addressed to some um, to some extent in the presentation <clears throat> but then we'll have some follow-up conversation after that and then we'll talk about the second part of the hello we'll talk about the second part of the um, the, the event after that so um, let's get started so cultivating prosperity um, what does it mean to be a financially resilient and prosperous community. Um, a couple of questions that we like to ask starting this off. Think about, uh, think about this community. Do you feel like Kyle right now has the money that it needs to pay for services and infrastructure over time? How much of the city's revenue stream is coming from volatile sources, something like sales tax, something like revenue that's coming from new development? Um, versus something that's more stable and predictable like property tax. Um, and then lastly, can you sustain um, this current and future uh, or this current future development pattern and all of the liabilities, the street infrastructure that comes with it um, and still keep Kyle affordable for the folks that live here today and in the future? <clears throat> all of those kind of form different angles at what does it mean to be fiscally sustainable, but ultimately it's about does the city have the money it needs to provide quality services and maintain infrastructure over time? Not just can you do it today or for 20 years or for 30 years, how do you do it in perpetuity? So the suburban experiment, this is, is something that Chuck Marone from Strong Towns um, came up with over a decade ago. and. Really what it talks about is post-World War II, um, the invention of the car, some of the changing in, in changes in housing policy, we shifted from a very slow incremental growth pattern where we built our cities a little incrementally over time and we switched to building it much faster, building our cities bigger lots, bigger neighborhoods, bigger subdivisions, and building it all bigger and faster. And what some would say to a finished state. So we, we say this is going to be single family residential and it's gonna stay this way for forever. 
versus building something in a way that can evolve and change <clears throat> over time, right? But as our cities have been pursuing this fast growth, they've, they've been pursuing the growth in the near term, they've been investing in some quality of life things, maybe it's a rec center, maybe it's a park system, what have you. Um, we haven't been keeping our eye on or fully considering the long-term costs and impacts that come with that. Um, we're talking mostly about fiscal, but there's environmental impacts that come with development, there's social impacts that come with development. But we have been so focused on what's the add, what's the value to our community today that we don't always think about what's that cost in the future, right? Um, and if you look at the second part of that text down there, we, we don't always like to have a lot of text on the slides, but sometimes if there's somebody that's watching this later that can't hear me present it or hear us talking about it, we want to have enough there that, to give them so, something to go by. But that second part talks about the, the growth model the private sector will build this, right? The private sector is going to come in, they're going to build the streets, the water, the sewer, the drainage, the parks, everything that comes with that development. But the city and the taxpayers are the ones that are on the hook to pay for that in the future, right? So what about maintenance after growth? What happens when the growth slows down? What happens when the streets and the homes and the neighborhoods that were put in 20 or 30, 40 years ago what happens when they start to age and need to be need to be maintained or need to be reinvested? And these are all real pictures. Um, these are places. Uh, a lot of what has informed my my approach, my thoughts, our principles for our philosophy for our firm um, came from around the last recession, 08, 09, 2010, when I was traveling around the country, working in different places, different communities, big city, small city, east coast, west coast, rural, urban. It didn't matter. Most of the cities that we worked in did not have the money that they needed to maintain their infrastructure. And so I started to ask why, right? <clears throat> and it comes back to the development pattern. If you think about how most of our cities grow, especially more of our suburban communities like a Kyle, you start out as a small, on, you start on the left side of this chart. You start out as a small community. You have the old kind of historic part of town where we are, right? Um, this area gets a little older. You don't add a lot of population, but the, the streets, the development starts to age a little bit, right? Then you get in the middle of this chart where your population, all of a sudden the growth comes to you, right? So the population starts to skyrocket. The developers are coming in. You're putting lots of new residential, lots of new commercial. And so as you drive around town, the most of the community looks new, right? So the average age of your infrastructure is going down because you're building a lot of new and the amount of the old stuff that you have is relatively small, right? This is where Kyle is right now. This is what Chuck from Strong Towns calls the illusion of wealth. You look around and you see everything and it's shiny new neighborhoods, subdivisions, schools, parks, and all of that, right? But how are we gonna pay for that on the back end? If you push to the right of this chart, what you start to see when you study cities is they run out of the land to develop. So the greenfield land, the land for new development, you start to run out of that land. So the revenue that the city gets from new development, the development fees, well, it could be additional tax, you know, tax bump as well, but a lot of times we're talking about just development revenues. That starts to slow down. And at the same time you start to see that happen, all of the infrastructure that was built by those developers 20 or 30 or 40 years ago has to be fixed. And that's what you see when you start to study Detroit, a Ferguson, a Memphis, a Shreveport, a lot of the older communities. They went through the growth phase, they flattened out, and they couldn't maintain everything. They have to start making choices on what neighborhoods are we going to save and which ones are we going to let go. When you start to let them go, i.e. not taking care of the streets or the infrastructure, the folks with the wealth that have the ability to move will. They might move somewhere else in your community. They might move out of the community altogether, right? So what we're trying to do with this process, when we talk about how Kyle is going to grow in the future, yes, we want to talk about what do you want? What, what would you like to have in the community? Where would you like to see it? But we're trying to ground it back in how can Kyle grow in a way that's going to flatten this curve so that you can keep up with maintaining what the developers put in on the front end. <clears throat> so this is just a, a slide of, that's weird, it has like a delay on that one. Um, this is a slide that shows, just kind of illustrates the, the what, what I like to call or, or what we call the resource gap, and it just focuses on streets and property taxes. If you look at this cul-de-sac street, you can make the argument that the only people that really benefit from this street are the people that live 
on that cul-de-sac, right? The majority of the community is not driving up and down that street, right? If you look at the cost to rebuild that, and these are, these are conservative on the low end numbers. Uh, a lot of times when we talk about construction costs, it can be a lot more. Uh, but the cost to rebuild just that portion of street, 231,000. Um, the life cycle of it, because it's an asphalt street, you're gonna get roughly 20 years out of it. Um, the tax revenue, the property tax revenue that you get from those adjacent properties is 32,000. So if you took 100% of that property tax revenue, that 32,000, 32, and you put it towards nothing but that street, you could pay it off in seven years, roughly a third of the life of the street. But 100% of our property tax revenue does not go to just streets, right? We have other things that need our money, right? Um, if you took, right now, you're spending roughly 8% of your general fund on streets between maintenance and reconstruction. So if you take 8% of that property tax revenue and put it towards this street, it would take you 90 years to pay it off. Four and a half times the life of the street, right? Um, if you wanted to break even, you would have to take 36% of your property tax revenue and put it towards the street to pay it off in 20 years. So this is just one case study. This is one example. But if you think about all of the streets across the city, building them like this, you can start to see why we're a little bit behind in our street funding, right? So in most cases, most of the communities that, that we've studied and others that do similar work to us, um, this auto-centric, this post-World War II development pattern where you're building a lot all at once in a spread out pattern, it struggles to generate enough property tax revenue to pay for all of the services and infrastructure required to serve it. So what happens is we fill that gap with sales tax. Sales tax is always the first place we want to go. We want to go get more sales tax so that we can take pressure off of the property tax, right? Um, and right now, development revenue, revenue from new development, development fees is filling some of that gap as well. But what we want to talk about is what is it going to take to continue to provide quality services to everyone in the city as you expand and also take care of the street and other infrastructure that you're building. So there's three options. This is, this is simplifying it down a bit, admittedly, but the first option here is we can keep building the way that we're building and we can raise taxes. We can basically say we're gonna raise taxes and fees to pay for what we have. Nobody likes that option. I've done this a lot of times. I have yet to see anybody that says, yeah, raise my, raise my taxes. They might say hold it, they might say hold it flat um, if I know it's going to just my street in my neighborhood. Um, but most of the time people, especially in today's environment, we're starting to feel priced out, right? The, the home values are going up, the tax rates are going up. So there's pressure at the council level to hold or even lower that property tax rate. I could give you examples of other cities, older cities that have a much higher tax rate than what we have in Texas, that have street fees, that are doing things as extreme as uh, a street assessment where they basically go out and take the, the cost of the street, they figure out what it's gonna cost to rebuild it, half of it the city pays for, the other half they take and they divvy it up across the property owners that live on that street and the bill goes in the mailbox and they have one year to pay it. So that's, that's the other extreme of if you're an older city and you're trying to catch up, that's what some are doing. Some are letting streets go back to gravel. Some people like, that blows their mind that in the United States we have some cities that are saying we're letting some of our streets go back to gravel because we do not have the money to maintain them. But it is happening. So option number two, so if we take raising taxes off the table, the second option is how can we reduce services? How can we, how can we align our services with the revenue that we have coming in? This is basically what we're doing today. We're looking at if we have a bond election, if we have a capital improvement program, if we have uh, water rates, right? We add up everything that we need and we say, here's how much we're gonna need to pay for that and then we set the rate at something that's more tolerable, right? Or we say we can do uh, a bond election for streets and we really need to fix all of these but we only have so much money so we're gonna go fix these 10 streets or this 10%, whatever it is. The other ones get pushed to out into the future. And you see that happen and happen and happen and we end up punting and deferring and deferring and then you end up that even though you're doing more and more bond elections, the, the gap that you have to fund keeps growing. 
Like we don't see very many cities where that gap goes, that gap goes down. So the other way to reduce services is, okay, we take the money that we have and so we say, oh, we can only have so many police officers. Or in an extreme case, somewhere like in Memphis, Tennessee, they actually de-annexed. They started to shrink the size of their city to align with the revenue that they had coming in. <clears throat> Nobody, so let's say we don't want to reduce our services. We want to maintain the services that we have. What's the third option? We call this develop responsibly. What, is, what does responsibly mean? This basically means how can we grow, how can we develop in a way that aligns our city's business model with what we're willing and able to pay for? So, and not just now, but also in the future. So how can we use and leverage the growth that is coming to grow in a way that's gonna help us kind of flatten that curve and close those gaps? How can we build more development that's gonna bring enough in revenue in to pay for those costs? <clears throat> and if you do enough of that, and if you do it in the right places, you can close those gaps without having to change the tax rate. So when you think about developing re when resp responsibly, when we think about Kyle's future land use map and where growth is gonna go, you have to understand trade-offs. Every decision that happens in a city, every decision that council makes in the planning commission, there's trade-offs, right? Everybody, sorry, I saw a black thing. Everybody says, I want stable services. You want predictable public safety, trash collection, you know, customer service from staff, all, all of those things. We want stable services, right? Um, we also want low taxes. And most of us will say, we also want low density, right? Very, very hard to get all three of those. The only, the only way that that's really possible is if you're in a rural environment and the definition of stable services is you kind of live out in the sticks and you know it's gonna take fire longer to get there, right? Um, so the definition of stable services is you know, maybe a little more modified for uh, for a rural environment where you could have high density, you could have low taxes, it's just the definition of services changes a, a little bit. <clears throat> what you can have is different combinations of these. So if you want low taxes and low density, then you have to have service cuts. If you want stable services and low taxes, you have to be willing to have higher density. If you want low density and stable services, then you have to pay more in taxes. There, one of those has to give to get the other two. So what we've found, if we, if we come in and we talk about a comprehensive plan and we say, oh, we're gonna talk about mixed use and we're gonna talk about density and we're gonna talk about road diets and active transportation, right? A lot of these, vision zero, I'll just throw out another one. There's a bunch of different terms that get thrown out in planning and engineering circles that the average citizen might not always connect with, right? We, we don't always understand what is a comprehensive plan about? What are we trying to do in terms of how the community is growing? But we found if we can put this in terms of dollars and cents, if we can make this about what are you paying for your home today? What are you gonna pay for your home in the future? What are you paying in taxes? What are you getting for those taxes? And how development decisions, where you put the growth, when you allow the growth to happen there, um, and how that development happens, what it looks like, um, all of those decisions impact what you're paying today, what's your quality of service that you're getting today, but they also impact those in the city's ability to provide those services for different tax rates in the future. So if we can frame things through this idea of fiscal sustainability, fiscal responsibility, um, we can get more people to the table and we can talk more about the solutions instead of just talking about um, you know, different issues at, uh, at different times. So let's talk about land use fiscal analysis. I'm gonna get kind of technical here <laughs> for a little bit, so, so bear with me. But um, what's important to, to understand is we have to get a baseline. We have to look at how is Kyle doing right now um, so that we can understand which places are performing well, <coughs> which places are, are needing to get subsidized with property tax or sales tax or, or other, um, or development in other parts of the city. So the way that we look at this is um, a metric, it's just property tax revenue per acre. So if you look at this map here, it's, it's one I like to use just to explain it here, but if you look on the left, this is Dallas County. <clears throat> um, and I like it just because it's a really stark contrast, it's easy to explain and, and talk from, but. 
On the left, you see appraised value. This is how we tend to think about the value of property, right? You look at this and you say, oh, that, that property's worth a million bucks or 200, you know, 200,000 or whatever the number is. We, we just think about here's the value of that parcel. We don't always think about the context of what's the size of that parcel or is it paying property tax or not? It may have exemptions on it, right? But if we look at the property tax revenue per acre, so if we take the actual revenue that the city captures in property tax and we divide that by the size of the property, the acres, you get a revenue per acre number. That's what the map on the right is. And if you're familiar with Dallas at all, there's been a conversation going in Dallas for years about the lack of investment in South Dallas, right? And the amount of investment that's going in North Dallas. So that dark green, the darker the green is the higher value properties. I have yet to see a map anywhere that shows the, that illustrates that lack of investment in South Dallas better than that one, right? But if you think about this from Dallas County, the county itself, the county has to serve that whole area, right? They have roads that they help maintain in there. There's a lot of unincorporated parts in there that, uh, that the county has to, to assist with. And then there's also a lot of cities in that bottom half of, of that area too that, um, that have services that they're providing, but they don't have that same revenue per acre coming back to them. <clears throat> so if we think about property tax per acre and different uh, revenue per acre and different kinds of development patterns that we might build in the community. Um, and let me stop here and say too, this is important to think about from the context of in a property tax state like Texas, what we build, what we put on the land, right? The city has a finite amount of land. What you put on that land should bring back enough in property tax to pay for the streets and part of the public services, right? You can, we can talk about what that ratio should be, but you should be building a pattern. We think that, okay, we're gonna build this, it's gonna bring enough back to the city that it's gonna pay for that road. It doesn't. Most of the time, the development we're building does not pay for all of the roads and the infrastructure that we're putting in. We think it is, <clears throat> but it does. And it might pay for preventative maintenance, right? It might pay for things in the near term, but it rarely, it rarely shows out and models out that it actually pays for um, the, the future reconstruction. So if we think about property tax per acre and, and development pattern here, let's look here at a 2,000 square foot home on three different lot sizes, right? <clears throat> we put it on the smaller lot on the left, it gets roughly 15,000 per acre, right? If you put that same size home on a bigger lot, on a 7,000 square foot lot, it gets less than half of that. So under 7,000 per acre, right? So the takeaway here is the more building coverage you have, the more building you put on a lot, the higher your value per acre is gonna be, okay? Um, the second way to think about this is going vertical, right? The more stories you put, the more value per acre you're gonna get. The simplest way to think about this is in a residential, residential neighborhood, residential subdivision, the street's the same, everything's the same, you have a one story, and a two-story, the two-story is worth more. It's going to get generate more in property tax back to the city. So everything the city builds is generating property tax revenue per acre back. And so, are you generating enough in that property tax revenue to cover the costs? Um, this compares a couple of patterns, um, different patterns here in Kyle. On the left is 0.66 acres um, right here next door. That generates um, almost 10,000 per acre, and this is just property tax. Um, and I, there's a couple of caveats in here I wanna address too, uh, make sure I'm, I'm clear here. But So the left side, you got 0 .66 acres, 9,600 per acre. On the right, you've got a typical suburban pad site where we're picking on Starbucks here. We've had Whataburger, we've had all kinds of different Jack in the Box. Um, but this one is 1.18 acres, so almost double the land footprint, but you can see the difference in the property tax revenue per acre, right? So a couple things, yes, there's sales tax, right? So these, these different businesses will also generate sales tax. Some of them, a Starbucks, a Costco, there's some out there that are kind of outliers and generate higher sales tax than most. Um, but generally, sales tax will follow the same trend as property tax, which, which is the more people you put in an area, the more tax revenue you're gonna capture. So, whether we're talking property tax or sales tax, the more people we put in an area, it's gonna generate more tax base back, back to the city. 
The second thing to point out here is a question that, that has come up frequently and it came up earlier today when we were talking about this, uh, some with the staff, but it's parking, right? The one on the left, the parking's in the street, right? The one on the right, the parking is on the property. But the thing to focus on here is just inside those boxes, what are you doing with that land? So yes, you're parking, in one case, you're parking it on the, on the street on the left, but I could also make the argument that the, the suburban style development, it, it's, going to, it's going to require more parking in a lot of cases, it requires more roads. So the development pattern and how much parking you need and the road design are all kind of connected, right? So if you build auto-centric only, it's going to require, it's gonna generate more traffic, it's gonna require more traffic, it's gonna require more roads, and it's gonna require more parking. Um, if you build in the more compact, walkable type environment like what you see around here in a lot of the old downtowns, what you see is more of a shared strategy to parking. So shared parking, shared detention, shared open space, and so you find areas to put that that all of the properties around there can benefit from as opposed to putting it on each site, right? The point with a lot of this stuff is this is just another data point to think about when you're considering development and when you're thinking about how Kyle is going to develop. Do you want a lot of land to go towards parking lots, which generates nothing in terms of tax revenue to the city? Um, or do you want to have more of a mix of these? There's no, and you'll, you'll hear me say this probably another two or three times through through this presentation, there's no right or wrong way to do all this. What we wanna do is put numbers to it and give you guys another data point that says we want, it's just like a personal po portfolio, you want different things that you're investing in. So as a city, you wanna build different types of development that give you different contexts, that give some people the suburban style, some people more of the walkable mixed use traditional style, and also change up those price points, right? But at the end of the day, as a city, you want to pencil out. You want all of it to add up and bring in the revenue that you need to cover the costs. Um, another example, I'm zooming out a little bit. This is downtown San Marcos. I can't see. So 0.42 or 42 acres on the left, 41 acres or 40 acres on the right, the traditional downtown pattern versus the big box. You can see the difference in property tax revenue per acre, right? Again, sales tax, the big boxes will generate some sales tax. There's a lot of things we could talk about as far as sustaining that long term, you know, um, you've probably heard about Walmarts that go for a while and then they're done. Um, that traditional pattern on the left, when we talk about sustainability, when we talk about resiliency, when a building or when a business goes out in the traditional pattern, a new one can go in, right? The street's there, the building's there, everything's there. You can just swap out a business. When you talk about more of the big box stuff, and we have several projects right now that we're doing civil on that we're trying to retrofit some of these. The options that you have to retrofit that one on the right are very, very limited, right? Again, not one or the other, but we're building far, far more, much, much more of the ones on the right, right? The suburban pad sites, the big box sites, we're building a lot of that and we're coding out, we're, we're making it a lot harder to build the stuff on the left. <clears throat> when you think about this from a homeowner's perspective, what's the taxpayer's liability, right? Couple things, this, just to, there's a number of different variables that we'll look at when we talk about development patterns and, and things that drive costs and revenues. Uh, but when we think about a residential neighborhood and a street, the width of the street and the width of the lots directly impacts the household's the per household cost to replace that street. So this shows 31 foot wide street, 70 foot lots, um, roughly a $532,000 street replacement cost. That's 19,000 per lot to fix that street, okay? If we reduce that street by four feet, if we go from 31 feet down to 27 feet and we put 50 foot lots instead of 70s, that cost per lot goes down to 12,000. So just by changing the width of the street and the width of the lots, you change what that cost per household is, right? So if you're having conversations about, and I have this with my wife all the time and some of our friends about just the width of our streets and how fast cars drive, and I'll say, I'm an engineer by degree, and I will tell you, if you want to slow cars down in your neighborhoods, narrow the street. You can put cops, you can have stop signs, you can do all that. If you speed humps, you can do all of those other things. If you really want to slow cars down in your neighborhoods, slow the street or 
narrow the streets, it forces you to drive slower. When it's wide, when it's 31 foot wide and it's long and straight, you can go a long way looking at your phone before you ever hit something, right? A little sidetrack on safety, but it all kind of comes back to the numbers too. <clears throat> so if we think about at a high level, high, the, the highest returning parcels, if we want to say we want to maximize revenue per acre um, in our community, these are, the, these are the trends that we see, not just in Kyle, but in a lot of the different places that we've modeled. You see a high ratio of building footprint to lot coverage. So you're putting more building on the lot. Um, Multi-story structures. The more you go vertical, the more value per acre you're going to get. Narrow lot frontage. So the narrower lots do better. Um, you want to take that block of street, and the more, the more houses you can put on a street, the more units you can put on a street, the more that spreads the cost burden out to each lot. And... Um, and improve, uh, improves their, their fiscal productivity on just a lot-to-lot -lot basis. Um, smaller lots do better. Um, and then when you zoom out a little bit and you look at the development pattern, the traditional neighborhood gridded streets do a lot better than the suburban, what I call the loops and lollipops, right? Um, there is nothing more costly to a city than cul-de-sacs. Cul-de-sacs are great to live on, people like the privacy of them, but from a service perspective of police and fire and trash, they're very, very inefficient. So do you want some? Absolutely. Um, but do you want to have as many as we built in some places? You know, maybe, um, maybe not. So some of this will come to play in like a zoning code or something like that. Um, but from a land use perspective, from a, a comp plan perspective, you know, just thinking about what are the characteristics of the things that generate the most value breaker back to our city so that we can generate more revenue without having to change the tax rate, right? So we went through a process here, we call it a land use fiscal analysis, a LUFA. There's three steps that we, that we went through here. The first step is we looked at the property tax revenue per acre. So we just take, here's the property tax revenue that, that every uh, parcel in the city generates. We divide it by the, the acreage and you get that levy per acre number. We use the data directly from the appraisal district. Y'all's appraisal district is a little wonky with, how, with some of their data. I know Will's familiar with it. We've talked about it with some of staff, but there's, it's not as clean. It was not as clean to go in and model as a lot of the other counties that we, we've looked at have been. Um, but you do property tax revenue per acre first, which shows that this is what every, every property in the city is bringing in. The second level that we went to is said, what's the general fund costs being covered by property tax? So the portion of the general fund budget that comes from property tax, which is roughly 30%, and we take those costs and we <coughs> allocate those to the properties as well. So you get kind of what some call the first red-green map or profit and loss map that shows here's what the properties are bringing in in revenue, here's what they cost to serve. Some, some generate more in revenue than they cost, some cost more than they, um, to serve than they bring in. Um, the third level that we look at is if we looked at what does the city really need for streets, what does the city really need to pay for all of the streets that you've built, and we add that in, um, and then we look at what it looks like. So our goal with all of this, and I'm gonna show you the Kyle numbers here in a second and some of the takeaways that we have from them, <clears throat> but we want to use this as the baseline to inform your land use map. We wanna put this and make this about where and when and how you grow to close that gap over time, right? We don't want, or if you're going to choose to make it a, a different way, you have to understand that there are costs coming that's going to have to be, you know, paid in the future and have a strategy to do, uh, to do that. And the last part there is important too. Um, this is ultimately about how can we align the growth of the city with what our residents are willing and able to pay for, not just now, but in the future, right? We can't make assumptions and say, well, everybody's going to be okay if our property values continue to go up 5% a year or 10% a year or whatever. Um, we have to think about what makes Kyle affordable, what's going to keep Kyle affordable, um, and for whom, and, and all of that, which we're going to get into uh, later tonight. So you saw that, that chart earlier that I showed that talked about the, the growth of a city, right? So here's Kyle's growth, right? Um, slow, 1960, up to 2,000, you were under 6,000 people, and then boom, your growth your growth came, right? So I told you Kyle was in the middle of that chart earlier, right? There's the proof. <laughs> You're adding a lot of people 
in a short amount of time. So let's see, from 2000 to 2021. So in 20 years, you added 45,000 people, right? So here's your budget breakdown, and this is something to, this, this is more at a staff and council level uh, that we dig into. But this on the left side shows the revenue breakdowns of the, the general fund. You have 16 million, roughly 30% of your budget comes from property tax. Um, another 31% comes from sales tax. This is something that, again, Kyle has added a lot of sales tax in the last couple decades too, right? You've added a lot of people. You've also grown your sales tax base. So you have a 50-50 split between property tax and sales tax, which is really good, right? That's actually where we advise a lot of, a lot of cities to get is a 50-50 split. But you have 20% of your revenue coming from development right now. So 20% of your general fund is coming from development fees associated with new development, permits, building fees, et cetera, right? What happens when your growth slows down and that revenue is not coming in anymore? It has to be replaced from somewhere, and that's one of the questions we're gonna dig into with council and, and planning commission a little bit later, right? Is when you have to replace that, where is it gonna come from? Sales tax, property tax, development pattern, all the above, it's gotta come from somewhere. Then if we go to the cost side, right, that shows kind of how your general fund costs are divvied up. You've got 32% going to police, 10% going to planning, um, and you're spending there little, almost 4 million, 3.7 million, 8% of your budget on streets, and that's maintenance and reconstruction together. There, that's just in the general fund. There might be some transfers and stuff in there too, I would imagine. <clears throat> so, Here's the, the street question. This is, this is just one that we like it to ask at a high level for an exercise for a comp plan like this. We could definitely do a deep dive and get deeper into this, but we did a, just a high level number. We said, let's look at the streets that, that Kyle has today and say, what would it cost if we were gonna rebuild those streets? Um, we got a number from staff of 750,000 a lane mile. Um, that's just just for the street. That doesn't include all of the other stuff of some of the sidewalks and the trees and the lighting and everything else that might go with it. It's just the street costs. Um, and even that, it's on the low side, right? I think to, if, if you're talking about rebuilding streets, especially in a downtown area or an existing neighborhood, it's more costly to rebuild than it is to go build something brand new out in a field somewhere, right? Um, but for purposes of this exercise, we, we started for concrete streets, it's one and a half million. Um, it can be a, a lot bigger. I'll tell you, we did a model back in 2017, 2018 for Brownsville. Their street liabilities were over a billion dollars. It was $65 million a year that they needed to be saving or spending on streets. And they were spending like four, right? You guys are spending 3.7. If you just take that straight line, if you take 750,000, it's roughly 360 million bucks, All right? 14 million a year, or 18 million a year. So you have a rough deficit right now, 14 million a year that you need to come up with just for what's on the ground right now. Any new street, any new road you build is gonna add to that number, right? So anything new that you build <coughs> needs to not just close the gap or not just pay for itself, but it also needs to help you close that gap. The good thing is Kyle is young, relatively young. You don't, these numbers aren't huge. I mean, a lot of the studies we look at are 800 million, 900 million. Um, and a lot of it is very poor condition that needed to be fixed yesterday, right? You guys have runway, you've got time. <clears throat> so just targets, this is something that we'll get into more when we look at our scenario planning. But right now, you're getting $765 an acre in terms of property tax. So across the entire city, you're, you're averaging 765 an acre. So if you just take all of the property tax revenue that's coming in, divide it by the whole size of the city, you're getting 765 an acre. Um, you need to be getting close to 2,000 an acre to cover your current costs. So you have parts of the city that are very, very high, high producing. Um, Plum Creek is one. You have places that are very, very high in terms of that revenue per acre, and then you have a lot of undeveloped land right now, basically, that's bringing that number down. So this, some of what we look at is what's been developed, what hasn't been developed, and how these numbers, you know, how these numbers look differently on those different categories. But 
you're building some of the newer stuff that you're building is very high value um, and closing that gap but you also have a lot of undeveloped area that has full service that has infrastructure that's not generating any anything right now right and then when we talk about where do you need to get in the future that number could come up or down depending on how you're going to grow are you going to <coughs> add all of the people into existing areas um, or are you going to add you know into some greenfield areas that add additional revenue so maps just real quick to show you what this looks like this is I got a really bad reflection up there but this is your property tax revenue per acre the darker the green the higher that it the higher it is um, when we add in the budget costs you can see some of the properties go red um, or a lighter shade of green um, and then when we add in those unfunded streets you can see even more of it goes red right so this is typical this is a scare this is what a lot of places look like a lot of that red is undeveloped land right but what we can do from this is we can dig into it because we have it in GIS, which we can look at it by parcel go and we can map it. We can also look at all the data behind it and we can start to study it and say, okay, well, how are different patterns performing different lot sizes, different zonings. And this is one that we did for single family lots. So on the left here is the left side of that chart is the smallest lots, two tenths of an acre and smaller, right? The right side of that chart is the big, the big lots, an acre or more. The gray, the height of the gray bar is the average value of the homes or the structures on those lots. That green line is the revenue per acre for each of those categories. So this trend has held true in every city that we've ever modeled. The smallest lots get the highest revenue per acre in the city. But what we see in a lot of cities is pushing towards we want bigger lots. Bigger lots equal higher, higher value, right? Um, and they can, but you also have to think about the price point of the, of the bigger lots and what it takes for those bigger lots to pay for the infrastructure or what that cost per household burden is gonna be on the road, right? It's not the same here in Kyle as it is in a lot of other places. In a lot of other places that we've looked at, that smaller category is also the most affordable. Right? That also tends to be, so it's a win-win a in a lot of ways. If it's the, the highest revenue per acre to the city, it's also the most affordable for, <coughs> for residents. So there's a lot of value in building small that a lot of cities have forgotten about. You all are somewhat unique in that a lot of your newer residential is still small lots. And I don't know the history here and what all the conversations have been about, about smaller versus bigger, but because you have so much of your new stuff in a small lot pattern. That's why you can see Plum Creek, you can see some of the other newer residential that's very dark green. It's performing really well because it's got a good strong development pattern of the smaller lots, but it also has really high values going, going with it. Um, we also, in addition to this, and, and I don't have all this in this presentation, but there's other tables that show for all the different lot sizes, zoning land uses so single family multifamily commercial we slice and dice it a lot of different ways for you that's information that can be used to inform um, what we do going forward here's your number one in terms of revenue per acre and net per acre in the whole city this is the highest producing property in the city in terms of property tax per acre um, it's a very very small lot it's 100 percent building coverage and so there's a very high revenue per acre to that uh, to that little building your number two goes up in scale a little bit it's actually right next to it um, it goes up to two stories and then this is what really jumped out to our team is number three was this small home you know up in Plum Creek it is 0.06 acres it's tiny it's a 17 an 1800 square foot home and its assessed value is 405,000 bucks. So when, if you go back to what I started this whole presentation with of the, the things that make a city financially sustainable, right? Value per acre, this is crushing it. This is, this is really, really good. But is it affordable for everybody, right? Or is it even affordable for most? And so that's what some of the question I think in some of the discussion in Kyle is going to have to be about is 
where does Kyle sit on being affordable to everybody? And if a small home, and in some other places, the strategy to get more affordable is go smaller, right? In the single family category. You're going about as small as you can go in a single family and it's selling for 400, right? So how do we fill that affordability gap in different ways? We're gonna need to think about different types of housing. We, we call it in the planning realm, we call it missing middle, but cottages, duplex, live work. There's a lot of different ways to build different kinds of housing that is affordable, that's not, you know, um, just the straight kind of garden style apartments that a lot of people think about when, you know, when we say affordable. So communities can, can go different ways on this. You can say, we, we want a pencil, we want to build a pattern that's going to be fiscally sustainable and pencil out, um, but we're going to do it this way. We're going to build very high value stuff like this that pays the bills, but you have to understand and you have to own that that means your community is not going to be affordable for entry level professionals, you know, et cetera. So you, you just have to think about that whole spectrum of what it means to be an attractive and sustainable place over time for, uh, for different folks. Um, one of the fastest ways to close the gap is infill development. Uh, and I'm going to provide a little more detail here in just small lot, one lot at a time. You, if you look at, if you look at Kyle, if you look at any community, there's vacant lots everywhere that they're right, they're full service. They've got full street, utility, police, fire, everything, and they're vacant, right? That's costing the city. The city is paying to serve that lot, and the taxpayers are paying to serve that lot, but you're not recouping anything back. Now, you can't force a property owner in Texas to go build, right? If they want to sit on it, that's their right to sit on it. Um, but just being aware of that, and saying, well, we have, you know, if we have 10,000 people coming to Kyle, do we want to put them into vacant lots and see how much of our vacant lots can capture more of those people? Um, or do we want to go put them in greenfield development that requires more infrastructure and, and services? Uh, but you can see just by putting small infill units into neighborhoods, what, how you can boost that tax revenue, you're not impacting the service costs here hardly at all. Now, if you get enough of these in one place, or if you build two-story or three-story, a higher density, you might get to a point that it starts to put pressure on your infrastructure that requires you to upsize infrastructure in downtown, right? But, and we'll talk about this more as we go through the, through the process and, and with staff, but this, the infill, that traditional pattern tends to generate enough revenue to cover, even if you're putting more investment in the infrastructure, it still covers that cost because the value breaker is so much higher. <clears throat> so the takeaways, just the big takeaways that we saw in doing this baseline analysis for, for you all. Um, you have to think, first off, that development number, right? 20% of your revenue is coming from development. You don't have to replace it right now, but you have to be watching that and be thinking about, as that starts to taper off, where are you going to replace that revenue from? Um, there's a, a community up in, in North Texas, uh, Fate, Texas, that we've done a lot of work with over the years. And they're, <clears throat> they're getting closer, they're, they're building out, they have a lot of in-city MUDs, um, but they're already starting to talk about what, how they're gonna replace that development revenue because they have so much, they've had so much coming from development revenue, they've gotta find a way to, to replace it. Um, the options here, right, you can, uh, you can increase sales tax. Um, and as it relates to the comprehensive plan process, we have to think about if we want to increase sales tax, what kind of businesses do we want? Where do we want to put those businesses? What's the right scale, right? We can't put all kinds of commercial right next to residential, but we could put neighborhood scale commercial close to residential that actually improves the quality of life um, in some neighborhoods. There's different scales to do commercial, there's different scales to do residential. But if we say that we're gonna close that gap with sales tax, our team needs to know where is that gonna go and what's it gonna look like that goes directly back into the future land use map. If we say, you say, we want to close that gap with property tax, <clears throat> there's two ways to get at it. You can raise the tax rate, which gets back to that earlier slide, right? Don't necessarily want to do that. Or you can look at how do you adjust the development pattern to get more value per acre without changing the tax rate, right? Um, so, you're looking at here, how do you replace that development revenue? And then also, how do you get enough revenue to close that street funding gap that, that we talked about? So 
which one of these is the best, um, you know, the best fit for Kyle? That's something again we're going to explore a little bit a little bit later with the council and planning commission. Second takeaway: um, your policy decisions, how you're growing today, is going to affect affordable housing in Kyle. So you need to be thinking about the community needs to be thinking about what does affordability mean to Kyle, and if you want different price points. How are you going to do that? Where are you going to put it, right? Um, I will say if you ignore and you just kind of keep building you know, one or two types, that is going to continue to drive the values up. The, one of the best ways to keep values down and stabilized is build a diverse mix of housing of different types so that people that want different things at different price points actually have that option and they're not forced to go into the one or two options that you're, uh, that you're giving them driving up demand uh, that maybe otherwise uh, wouldn't be there. Um, so continue, continue as you are and just know what that means in terms of affordability. Just continue, doing, continue building the way that you are and knowing that you know, 400,000 for a 1,800 square foot home is kind of is the low end of what you're gonna get going forward. Um, or look at what's the diversity of housing types that we can build. What, what can we do to change those price points for different, different folks? I always like to emphasize here, affordability does not have to mean poor quality, right? Just because it's affordable does not, does not mean it has to be crap. You can do really, really high quality, really small stuff. Another question I like to ask here is, raise your hand if you ever lived in an apartment. Almost everybody, right? So. If that's the case, why, why do we have such kind of the, the bad vibe in today's world about we're anti-apartments, right? It's more about the quality of them, where do you put them, how do you maintain them? There's a lot of things that go with it, but apartments on their own are not bad. Rentals on their own are not bad. It's code enforcement, it's other things associated with rental, that, rentals that you have to, to think about. And again, when you think about affordability, there's a lot more people that are gonna need rentals because they can't afford the price point where single family in, in Texas is, is headed. So there's a lot of ways to get there, but what we need to know from you guys are what are the priorities? What are the, the values in Kyle now and in the future that you want us to kind of work within? The last takeaway, um, growth management. So a city can guide where the growth goes, right? I, I mentioned earlier, say you have 10,000 people coming to Kyle. You can put them all in existing neighborhoods. You can put them all all in existing neighborhoods with it without having to build any more ex any more infrastructure, right? You could put them all in infill, or you could try. You could say we're going to split it. We want some in infill, but we want you know some of it in greenfield, uh, greenfield parts of the city. If you're going to do so, the the way that we would kind of describe this, there's two ways to think about growth management and the development pattern in general. One is the location. Where are you building? So the most fiscally productive approach is start inside out. So infill the small lots, then if you're gonna do the next level of infill would be infill around existing infrastructure, right? You wanna make sure you have as much development around all of the roads and the sewer and the water lines, everything that you've built before you go punch another street or another water or sewer line out to Greenfield, right? If you're prioritizing fiscal productivity. The other way is the pattern. So one, one way is you control the location of where it is um, the other way is the pattern. What what are we actually building? When we're going to build something, um, what does it look like? Is it the high value per acre stuff? Is it lower value per acre, but it's helping us diversify that housing spectrum? Um, a lot of different ways to think about where and how you build, but you frame it all back to what is it going to generate in tax base, what it's going to cost the homeowner, and then what it's going to cost to serve. So this ultimately, we're, we're talking land use, we're talking a little bit of, of dollars and cents and numbers for the growth, but what we're ultimately trying to do is build a fiscally sustainable Kyle, build a place where people want to stay and be today, they want to come to, but also where multiple generations can stay over time and want to come over time. Um, and to do that, you've got to keep it, uh, you've got to keep it affordable and keep those services up too. So um, last thing on here that I wanted to mention before we get into questions, um, we do have, so this is presentation, I'm going to take questions that that you all in the audience have um, about this presentation first. If you're thinking you want to have input and provide input on where you think different things could go, 
If you wanna have input on your specific neighborhood, that's what tomorrow is for. So we have a couple of different meetings. We've got one 12 to three o'clock at fire station number two. Our whole team's gonna be there all at the same time. Um, and then we've also split this out into four simultaneous meetings. They're all gonna be happening at the same time tomorrow night, but at four different locations. Content's gonna be exactly the same, whether you come to the, the afternoon one or the evening one. Um, but we're just trying to find ways to reach as many, many people at different times. So the afternoon one, the evening one spread out, that, that you'll have an opportunity to actually look at maps and tell us a little more about what you, know, what you like about your neighborhood, what kind of development you think can go there. Yes, sir, Will? Kevin, I'm sorry, there's a typo on there. It's gonna be Wednesday the 15th. Oh, so. sorry. Yeah, so Tuesday the 13th that. isn't right either, is it? Right. Yeah. So it, the, the, the times are correct. The, the, time, the times and locations are right, but it's yes. actually Wednesday. Yeah. It's not tomorrow. It's not Valentine's Day. We're not, we're not going to ask you to come geek out on land use with us on Valentine's Day. I'm sure some of you are, you're, you're already writing it in. You're at date night. No. Um, no, it's, it's Wednesday night. So thank you, Will. Um, so yeah, let's, let's take some questions from them first and then if we wanna have time to, any questions, anything that you learned, any, anything that was confusing? Yeah, I, I yes, sir. When, when you were talking about sales tax and you were comparing, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 the center field down here mm -hmm. compared to uh, Starbucks. Health, or mm -hmm. Starbucks. Now, and then there's another, my question, <coughs> is, okay, my question also another discussion, another comparison I'm, I'm thinking of the the uh, central area uh, west of 1626 Kohler's Crossing area. There's a, a medical there are medical facilities, uh, restaurants, coffee uh, restaurants, and so the sales. I'm assuming that the sales tax is much higher there because it's really not private parking. I mean, there's parking. But it's kind of open parking. You can park pretty much anywhere. Mm -hmm. You can walk to your medical facility or get some coffee or the restaurant. Versus here in Interstate 35. So you have 35 and you have all these takeouts going up and then the restaurants going up. And so their sales tax, if it's, com if it's comparable to Starbucks, I'm just, I'm just questioning it. You know, is it possible to maybe change uh, 35? Like, of course, it's probably too late now. But if it had, if it had been altered to a similar plant as that one over there, would we be getting more sales tax out of the interstate, or are we not getting as much? You know, well, I'm, I'm just comparing. Yeah. That. So. So first, so this stuff all focuses on property tax, right? So and part of, part of why I like to come back, we've, we've always been asked about sales tax in this presentation and sales tax is part of the equation. But what, what I saw in other parts of the country and what you start to see in Texas is when your development pattern is not productive enough for property tax, you need to subsidize it with sales tax and other things to cover those gaps, which is okay to a point, but when you start to see sales tax used to cover more and more of the basic services, um, it can be it can be fragile to an extent. And you know, you're you you have you have to have some sales tax, and that's something we were talking about earlier. Is Kyle has added a ton of sales tax in the last 10, 20 years, right? Um, but you know that sales tax can be it could be like more auto like auto oriented regional commercial that's like a, a big box or some of the power centers that we see that attract people from a, a larger area that come in and they need the bigger parking and you have areas like that that they're not as efficient property tax per acre but they are they are higher higher sales tax producers right but the traditional pattern like what we're talking about here if it's done well it's a home run for property tax per acre it can also be a home run for sales tax and so a lot of the, the newer like mixed use style developments like Plum Creek and the one you're, a lot of that new, that's more of the traditional kind of mixed use style where you come, you have a parking garage, you get out and it's all narrower streets and more pedestrian focused, right? But that all, that model only works if you have enough residential with it, right? 
So, and that's something you have to think about too from the economic development standpoint is things that are trending in economic development. If it's gone from industry-based and traffic volume-based to place-based economic development of companies wanting to be in great places because that's where the people want to be and the talent wants to be, now it's almost getting to the point that it's people focused, that it's individuals that say, I don't want to commute, I can work from home. And so they're picking where they live based on the neighborhood where they, because they can still go kind of have more employment choices. So economic development and employment is, is changing, um, but the context of more people and more ages um, wanting more of the, the walkable mixed use environment, we need to provide more of that in Texas whether it's residential or commercial. Um, uh, but yeah, the scales, and that's what we're gonna get into. There's scales between auto-focused and pedestrian-focused and then highway commercial versus inside your, your neighborhood. So um, again, you need both. But what we've seen and why we focus back on property taxes, you should have a sufficient property tax base so that your sales tax can go towards growth and quality of life, which what which is what sales tax was originally intended to do. It should be going towards investments in growth and quality of life, not to pay for the basic general services, right? I have a few comments, of course. Sure. Um, my first comment is, is um, I came from a city, a big city at that. I purposely moved to the city of Kyle to be away from the city. I came from Las Vegas. Um, I work construction, so I'm very familiar with streets. Um, I'm actually familiar with development and taking care of some of the streets when they build their homes. I came to the city council a few years back making a comment about a subdivision going in, and I brought up a couple comments. One of them is when you build a bunch of homes in one area, Where's the infrastructure of the police department, the fire department? Because you're putting more people in that area. It's crowded. You're going to get more trouble. And that means we're going to have to have more police and fire apartments. There's nothing wrong with apartments. But when you have four floors of apartments, you got more people. Cause more problems. Apartments don't pay taxes. They, do they pay property taxes? Not much. Not when we're getting from homes. A couple years ago, mm. when we were, well, I like to see the numbers. I didn't see no numbers. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see stats. Yeah. I'm a stat person. Sure. A um, couple of years ago. Uh, I will say multifamily in Kyle is right up there with the small lot single family in terms of value per acre. It's just the owner of the apartments, is, the complex is paying it, not the individual tenants. And the tenants. tenants are paying for it with rent. Right. Okay, a couple of years ago, you mentioned that the city of Kyle's get $765 for every home that they sell. Well, a few years back, and I want to say about three years back, we were told it was about $1,000 per home. No, that home you're get, they're getting seven, Kyle is getting well, seven, it's 765 per acre, not per house. Per acre? Okay. So that's just the total, the total property tax revenue that the city brings in divided by the total area of the city. So in this subdivision, I'm not quite, I'm not going to bring it up, but um, I was, we were told that they were going to get from all those homes that they were going to build in that area, they're going to get a thousand dollars for it. Those acres were smaller than an acre. So I still, again, the numbers don't balance. Um, I have, so and then I question, you're going to put smaller streets, I agree, smaller streets do slow people mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. More lots, crowds. Crowds cause problems. I mean, I purposely moved here for the rural area. Mm -hmm. I don't want a city. I mean, go back to Las Vegas and live in that city. And then I watched Las Vegas go to a boom where they build tons of homes in the small area. It's a ghost town. I still go back to Vegas. I have families mm -hmm. there. It's a ghost town. We just did work out there. Is that what's going to happen yeah. here? The housing development is going to stop because of the prices. You got interest is going up, <coughs> prices of homes going up. People are not going to want to pay. People are not going to want to move from Austin to here to pay the same taxes on property as they do in Austin. We're paying, 
outrageous taxes for our property. It's crazy. There's no tax deduction for our property. If you live in Austin, you're a certain age, you get a tax break. Not here. So, so let me, so let me just kind of yeah. frame it because I, I hear you. I hear you. So, a couple, a couple of things, and, and I want to just, I want to, we need to get facts and not just beliefs, right? More people in an area does not necessarily generate more crime. I know there's, I know, I know there's a belief that it does. It doesn't. I live in the city, so I have, I, I see this, that. but but we're not talking. We're not talking about urban city. We're talking about neighborhoods where, again, like eyes on the street, front porches, people know each other. It's it, there has to be. You have to think about the design of it, and this gets more into codes and things that come after the comp plan. Um, if we do have, and we have. A huge challenge in Texas with everybody drives right now, and it's hot most of the time, right? Um, and how can you go? How can you go all the way to a more compact, walkable environment when everybody still has two cars or three cars or whatever? So it's it's kind of if you build a more walkable, compact neighborhood, you can eventually take cars off of the road. But if all you do is build the apartment complex or build you know build a development that's this low density that's going to have, you know, three cars per house or whatever, you are going to generate some some more traffic. So, again, I, I'm going to bring this back, and this is what you'll see us do, and what I think staff and council should start to do is bring it back to the numbers, right? If you want, if Kyle chooses and says we want spread out development, we don't want the density, we don't want all of the people packed in here, then and you're going to have more of a driving environment that requires wider roads and more parking. The disconnect right now is in that regard, you're getting a Cadillac and you're paying for a Yugo, right? And it's not just Kyle, it's everywhere. We have been getting a certain kind of development that has a bigger cost to it that we have not been honest about what it really costs to maintain, right? So if you want those things, that's great, but there's a higher price to pay for it that is coming in. It's back to that choice. It means higher taxes or street fees. You can't, most cities cannot sustain that pattern without getting more revenue from somewhere. The other side of that is everybody has different thoughts about where they want to live, how they want to live, right? So just like you have certain beliefs about where you want to live, there's other folks that would like the walkable neighborhood that probably would like to have more people around. And so you have to just have to think about what is the right context for that for Kyle also, and where does that go? If if you build, it's it's like I said, you can't build all. It's it's not a you know all or nothing kind of thing. Um, but the last the last point back to your property tax thing, it's seven sixty five per acre across the whole city. The development that's coming in is much higher than that, right? The the development that's coming in is more three thousand, four thousand. Those top three were like. I don't even, I don't want to, I don't want to lie. I'm going to tell you uh, that number one is 79,000 per acre, right? This single family home right there is revenue per acre, 36,000 per acre. After you load streets in, it's 32,000 per acre. So that is paying its way all day long. Is that property tax you're telling me that they're paying? Yeah, that's property tax. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's the prop. <laughs> So its assessed value is four hundred and five thousand, um, but the actual property tax revenue per acre that the city is getting is thirty six thousand an acre. I have a question about that. Yeah. If we're talking about revenue um, and its acreage, because I don't want to get houses mixed up with acreage mixed up with square feet. That's that's a mind game, and I'm not going to do that. <laughs> okay. So my house. Since I'm less than an acre and it's in a cul-de-sac and it's in a neighborhood, my land value is $64,800. And I do not live in the nicer part of Kyle. I live on the, you know, on the east side in the older subdivision. So I guess my question is, how did you guys come to that number? This is straight. No, 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 765. I know that's an uh, average, but I'm thinking, geez, that has to be. It, what it comes down to is just the amount of undeveloped, undeveloped land, land that you have in the in the city. You so well, you've added a lot of people, but you also and we have a slide that we show sometimes that shows the population growth, but also the expansion of the city. So Kyle's footprint, while well, you've added a lot of people, you've added a lot of land too, right? So you have a lot of land right now that's exempt or generating darn near nothing in property because it's undeveloped. So that's bringing that number down. So you, so don't, I, I want to make sure I hammer this home. In terms of what you've built on the ground, 
you're doing a lot better than a lot of other places like the Kyle. So what would your um, suggestion be for the, the idea or the fact that Kyle has a lot of undevelopable land due to flood and flood plains? That's a, so you can't build in the floodplain. Um, I mean, it's actually going to be even harder with the new with the new regulations. Did you take that into consideration when you did this report? Yes. Yeah, so we looked at it both both ways. We look at the total area, and then we also look at just the taxable land. And we run that number both ways. And I don't remember which number that 765 is. If it's the total, I'm, I think it's the total city that includes undevelopable land with it. But all that said is you have. You still have those areas. They're they're in the city. You could sometimes there's no maintenance or nothing associated with a with a floodplain. But and that's a level. Sometimes when we do a standalone fiscal analysis, we'll get much deeper into some of those things. That's not something that we can do with and still do all the comp plan stuff with it. We're just trying to get kind of the the principles here that get you kind of part of the way there. But we did look at you know the again the overall area that includes any exempt land, any undeveloped, you know, floodplain, whatever. Um, and then we also looked at what's that number just for the taxable land. And so I can look that up and get that. I'll get that to Will and he can share it with you. So you have that number too, because it's important to know, right? You want to know what those numbers are for. This is, this is an area that's developed and served, right? So it's developed and it's also getting city services. What revenue are you getting for that? This is an area that's served. So it has services infrastructure, but it's not developed yet. What are you getting for that? And then there's unserved, undeveloped, that it's just sitting there, right? But you haven't punched infrastructure to it yet, so the services, service cost is a lot lower, right? So as part of going through this, we did look and say, what, how can we allocate services in a way that developed land is carrying more of the service cost weight than undeveloped land, right? Um, and the more developed it is, the more served it is, it's got more cost to it. So the, develop, the developed properties are carrying more of the cost than the undeveloped properties, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I guess my concern would be like developed land versus undeveloped land versus undevelopable land. Undevelopable. We <laughs> yeah, we can't really <laughs> assume that every inch of cow is going to be able to be developed. So to make us like a, a fair assessment, we would have to say it, this part doesn't matter because it's, it's never going to be able mm -hmm. to be developed. And so mm -hmm. really, we're not looking at this overall. <clears throat> we're looking at just these two sections, which is developable versus that is, This is a great question, and it's some, It's very important to know. Is what, and we have, Karina's going through this with the processes. What's your developable land? What's your undevelopable land? And then what are these, not, you know, these targets that we talk about here at the end? That again, I, I hesitated whether or not I even wanted to sh show targets yet because we're kind of early in the process. Um, but, good night, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it went. Oh, there it is. So this kind of stuff, the next phase of this process is to dial this in a little bit. So we did an initial assessment. We're talking with staff. We've gotten some feedback. But you want to know what these numbers are. They're great questions of, the, of what, what is the total land, what's the footprint of land we can actually build on, um, you know, and what does the revenue have to be of that land to cover, to cover everything. So. I mean, right. I mean, you're, you're, shed, you're talking about just revenue, but what are the expenses that go in getting those revenues? Right. You build all these homes, you still have expenses. How is that going to, you know, got to pay for that? Right. I mean, it's, I mean, it's great presentation. It's all revenue. But I don't no, know. no, there's cost in So we used to do just the revenue side. We used to just show the revenue side, and it would show downtown and tall buildings. Ooh, this does great. But there's a service cost to it. But what I can say that when you really drill into the service cost, that there is the there's a perception out there that density costs more than spread out, and that's not always true. Sometimes more spread out can cost more because it's so spread out, and the cost of the infrastructure to get everything out there, right? The water towers, the pump stations, the wider streets, the additional fire stations, everything that comes comes with that. So there are absolutely service costs, which is, that's really the gist behind this whole thing is there's more service costs. When you factor in everything to the city now and in the future, you have more costs that you have to cover that right now you don't have the revenue to pay for. Now, if you keep cranking in the, the infill development with what you've been building, your, your revenues are going to go up. You're not going to add a lot in terms of infrastructure costs. You will add some service costs of police and fire and additional staff for those people. But 
you're probably going to add those same costs if you put those people out in the edge too. So the real driver on how fast you close the gap or how fast you make it bigger is infrastructure. It's infrastructure, infrastructure, infra are you building more or are you putting development around what you have? If, if I can just uh, intervene real quick, and I guess that's what we as council and then PNC we can look at. Like our, we can finally get with, maybe as well with you to get the plan going to say like what's right now as of today, what's our total percentage of build up? Okay, and then that includes new infrastructure or anything like that that's on the table. Can you awesome. Speak a loud? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. All right. So what I'm asking them is that what we can do going forward is to kind of see the percentages of the build out that we have in the city. Okay, where where are we at right now for the year as far as what growth that we're seeing? Where's our percentage that we need to look at? Okay, the percentage of build out that we have right now. Number two, what new projects that we have coming forward, we can start looking at that. That includes any new infrastructure. That includes streets and so forth, the dimensions and everything like that. And also, what we hit the main points was location. You know, a lot of people say east side, west side. I think the whole city everywhere is beautiful. Okay. We have, we have great neighborhoods everywhere. What, what side are you looking on? So we got to look at the location and also to see if it is developed. Because again, this is all farmland that we grew up on. That's all developed out there. It's going to flood no matter what. But it's a matter of whenever we have these developments that come in, how can we get with engineers to make sure that how we can alleviate some of that flooding and make it safe and also look at the lot size and so forth. Because again, what I'm hearing from you is everybody else, same thing with me, affordability, how much it's going to cost, correct? It's all about the dollars in the end. Affordability in this city is getting more expensive and so forth, right? $8 a gallon, $8 for a dozen eggs, three fifty for gas. I think we're all on that same level. But I think we're going forward when it comes to this, we have to see where we're at going forward. Yes, we're still early in the game. As far as our population growth, but this is where we as a council and P and Z can be able to look at these numbers and kind of start to see whatever's coming our way, we can be smart about the development and so forth and how it can benefit the taxpayer, which yeah. is all of us. That's, so I want to I wanna redirect us because we do have kind of have to separate community meeting from, from some of the council discussion. I want to sure. make sure we get input from, from you all. That's what the first the first part is for. But I will say what you just said is exactly where this process goes. It's it's data informed, it's math informed of what are these different growth scenarios. And I'll, I'll just, I'll point you to um, the Taylor uh, comp plan that we just, we were on the team that just finished that one. And where that one went is they ended up with two growth scenarios. One was continue business as usual, grow out around the edge. The other one was a more fiscally sustainable, fiscal, you know, fiscal first, I think is what they were calling it, but it was infill out. And when we went through the math and went through the process with the community, when they got down to voting for those two scenarios, over 80% of the people that responded to the survey picked the infill one because they saw it could preserve some of the traditional neighborhoods, could give them the mix of housing, and it made them, you know, help them close the, the gap. So that's the same process that we're going to go through here. It's going to be your choices. It's Kyle's choices on which way you go, but we're going to put math to it and just give you the, the data point. So I know you have questions and we'll... We'll get to you. But do you do you all have any more any any from the community? My only question is: Will this PowerPoint be available on the city website? Or I believe so. Yes. Yeah, it it. Someone sends it to me. I can add it to the city website. And yeah, I was going to ask for that. Too. Thank <laughs> okay. you. Thank you. Yeah, that was easy. <laughs> I like easy ones. My other question is: You know, when you when you're doing this research in the city, are you is there any other city that? is comparable to our our city where they may have where you can say well in this city did such and such uh, growth here in infrastructure here and here and there and if, if, if it's if, if it might work for the city of cop I mean, is there, is there such i think thing? i mean this process of what we're going through is pretty new and um, there's not a lot of folks that that do it i think that's um you know 
that's something our firm is very passionate about doing and part of I think why why we got selected to, to do this one our, our approach is not for everyone because sometimes frankly the numbers scare people um, and sometimes when it gets down to making those choices about what you really want they're hard choices right um, but we, we have studied a lot of places we have context data from different places on on how different patterns perform but you still have to you have to localize it to this community your con your market your tax rate you know your needs and that's the service cost the value side we can look at the whole county and we can map value breaker pretty easy right and show you what's got the highest value breaker in the whole county but the cost side of it is local that's a city discussion about what you have what you're going to have um, and what those costs are so there's lessons learned here and i showed you that one slide that shows here's the characteristics of the highest producing parcels that's across all of our studies and that one chart that shows the single family going down from up there that's held true everywhere the the values change a little bit and the the slope of that line of the revenue per acre line will change a little bit but the trend is usually the smaller lots have the highest revenue per acre um, so there's takeaways that we can get there and there's context that we can certainly pull into conversations but the solution is really it's a community conversation um, and it's what fits here right and part of my job in this first presentation is just to hold up the, mi the mirror and be a little I, I don't want to be doom and gloom but I also want to be realistic of, of the engineering profession my, my fellow PEs we have not done a good job of really quantifying what the real costs of development are on the back end developers will come in and they'll tell you all day long here's what we're bringing to the city here's the tax base the rooftops all the sales tax everything else but it's the city's job to look at the back end and say what is it going to take and how are we going to pay for it and don't get me wrong i mean private the developers are a big part of the solution um they can also be the big part of the problem if you're not directing them in the in the right way so yes ma'am what you haven't integrated into this presentation that i expect you have considered uh, is parks and recreation and the appropriate balance between parks and recreation which tend to not generate revenue but they're critical for quality of life Great. so what we're not really considering in these presentations is quality of life which i think you know is a really important it's one of the reasons i moved talk to kyle because i wanted exactly opposite what she did <laughs> I moved to because I like the concept in the near areas of Plum Creek where you have very small lots. People sit on their front porches and meet each other. We have houses that are on a green belt and they face each other. You know everybody from four or five blocks. That's what I wanted. That's not for everybody. But the quality of life issues, the new urbanism that we've been using in some of our development concepts, like, yeah. like um, bricks and mortar, um, the five concept, I think, is phenomenal. Uh, but it, you're, we're not really including that in this. So do you have some metrics on that? Yeah. So great, another great point. I really appreciate the, the point, and the point and the question. Um, so quality of life, there, there was a great study from IBM years ago now, probably 10, 12 years ago. But quality of life is ultimately measured at the neighborhood level. And the best metric for that is the property value. If you're building a great neighborhood where people want to be, the property values are going to go up. If you're building a crappy neighborhood or you're not taking care of it, then people are going to leave, right? But open space, um, open space is critical to quality of life. Um, and when you think about, we in the early years of Redunity, we, we did a lot of what, what I call stack function green infrastructure, but it was it's using open space in a way that managed stormwater, but it also created quality open space that, that added value. So when you put a park, a lot of the like the downtown examples that we show, they'll have like one block that's it's not it's tax exempt. It's not generating property tax, but it's contributing to the value of that neighborhood. And I think parks and open space are similar. We can we can look at buffers around different kinds of different shapes and sizes of parks and what that does to, to quality of life but you know open space and parking are two things there, there's different data points that you have to think about if if all you're doing is trying to maximize value per acre and we say oh let's put a building on every inch of every lot right that's going too far the the other way so where can you put regional detention where can you put shared open space that adds value to the community and to the neighborhood um, 
knowing that that portion of land is not going to generate tax revenue, but it is adding to the values of what's around it. Um, you know, in open space too, same thing, scale. <coughs> Rural estate, if you're out kind of in the country, you don't need neighborhood parks because everybody has a five acre lot, right? It's one of the things that drives me nuts in a lot of suburban neighborhoods, including mine, is we have homes with big backyards and then we have the neighborhood parks like literally right down the street and then another. So we, we have a lot of open space that doesn't all get used because um, you know, we, have, we have basically too much of it. So anyway. I think, AJ, am I on track, or are we? Yeah, I think we're going to take a break before we move into the next session. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to take a break before we get into the, the Council Planning Commission. On the next part, we've got some questions that kind of those three takeaways. We're going to dig deeper into those three and take more questions and have more discussion on them. Um, you guys are welcome to stay and listen to that conversation as well. Um, we do have a, a quick break, so if you have a couple of questions for for me or for our team, we can take those before we get into the next one. But yeah, I want to end with reminding you about this. This will give you more chance to interact with our team one-on-one. -on, -one. on Wednesday the 15th, not Tuesday the 13th, which is Wednesday. Yes. Is there any way to update the slides? Yes. So we, we've before, done. that, yeah, that, yeah. Like, so right now. We've so already we'll, done it. It won't be oh, on this one right here, but the one that I'm about to hand over. I yeah, if anybody's watching at home, I'm just going to reiterate this verbally since you may not, but it's, <laughs> yeah, it's Wednesday the 15th. Uh, the times and the locations are right, but the date up there is wrong. So it's Wednesday, February 15th. So go have yourself a good Valentine's Day. Um, we're going to have a little Valentine's Day amongst ourselves with our team. And, uh, but yeah, Wednesday the 15th is when those meetings are happening. So And we'll get make sure that the version that we get to you to put up is fixed. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate you coming out. everyone the time is 7 45 p.m it is monday february we'll say 13th uh and i'm going to call this uh, special city council workshop to order with the city secretary please call the roll mitchell here tobias here heiser he's here so Flores Hill. here zuniga bradshaw Parsley. Here. All right, let's let the record show Councilmember Heiser is present as well, although tardy. Here. And uh, uh, this is also a workshop, a joint workshop, so we're going to let P and Z now call their role and gavel in as well. Thank you. The time is 7.46. Today is Monday, uh, February 13th, and I'd like to call this Planning and Zoning Commission workshop meeting to order. May I have a roll call, please? Delori. Here. Mata. Here. Anken. Gara. Here. Stiegel. Here. James. Chase. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. All right. Uh, next up is the citizen comments period. This will be for P&Z and for City Council. So we're going to open up citizen comments period. Is there anyone who wishes to come forward uh, and speak during the citizen comments period? Seeing none, I'm going to close citizen comments period. It's now closed. Next up is general discussion. Facilitated discussion between the Planning and Zoning Commission and the City Council focusing on key questions for policymaking and governance, uh, uh, building on the information shared during the preceding public open house, specific polling questions on uh, options for closing the fiscal gap, housing affordability and intensity of uses will be asked. Verdunity will facilitate the dialogue and gather responses from these groups to inform the plan's content. Thank you, Mayor. Um, AJ Favre with Virginity for the record. Um, Kevin Shepard, our CEO, is also in attendance and will both be sort of tag teaming as we work through this uh, presentation with you all tonight. We thank you in advance for your time and your attendance. Uh, we do want to be mindful of everyone's time tonight, so we're going to try to keep moving and, of course, stay within the time frame that we've established so that we can get you all on with your evenings. So a few things that we're going to do tonight is build on what you've recently seen in the community conversation presentation that Kevin gave a few moments ago uh, for the first 90 minutes of our time together tonight. Uh, you might remember that at the end of that conversation, he ended with three different takeaways that are takeaways that are unique to your fiscal analysis for your community. And so as we move into the next phases of putting the comprehensive plan together, it's important that we have some high level um, consensus from you all as it relates to some of those takeaways. So I know that to build on some of his comments from earlier, these are weighty issues. 
and we're not going to be able to solve them all tonight for, for sure. So um, we understand that you may have some different situations in mind when we're going through the different questions. And so we ask you to just continue to think of these as very high level conversations. Um, as we're working through engagement for a, a planning effort like this, we are very purposeful in putting together survey questions that point us in the direction on the schedule that you all, the client, have worked out with us. And so these are pointed questions um, that will help us understand your take on each of those three takeaways. So the setup that we'll have for the remainder of the session tonight is with each takeaway, Kevin's going to come up and he's going to kind of tee up that conversation. We'll start with takeaway one here in a moment. After he's given you some preliminary comments to kind of get you ready for that conversation, we have a series of questions that we'll be asking you on each of these takeaways. And we're going to ask you to actually use your cell phones this evening to respond to those questions. Uh, we're going to be using an instant polling software that will show us responses. And so on the table there around you, uh, you'll see some sheets of paper that have a URL and a code for that survey. And so you might go ahead and get your cell phones out and start queuing that up. We'll let you know when it's time to vote on each of those questions. These are anonymous. They're really just to try to understand where you are as a baseline on each of these different items. Um, after each question, we'll have a little bit of conversation, try to understand some key takeaways um, that are really important from you and your vantage point on those questions. As you're using your cell phones, uh, it should come up fairly easily for you. We do have other staff members here in the room that can help you if you run into any technical difficulties. Just let us know. We'll have one of them come over and help you. After you answer each question, you'll see a button at the top of the screen that says go to next slide and we'll ask you to touch that button after you've answered each question. So we'll get ready to start those survey questions in just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Kevin um, to sort of tee up this first discussion that's based on takeaway one from the presentation. It does say that voting is closed. Is Correct. It won't open until we actually get to that slide. No early answers. <laughs> Wait. Yes. Um, good evening, Mayor, Council, uh, Planning Commission. Good to see you again. Um, I'm going to keep these relatively brief. Um, the first takeaway is you, you heard, I think everybody saw the presentation, right, that was just done? Most of you? Yeah. Um, so the first takeaway, this idea of development revenue that you need to re replace. So you have to capture re additional revenue for two things. You've got to close that development, the, the revenue you're getting from development, you're going to have to replace that over time. And then you also have to make sure you have additional revenue that can cover those additional infrastructure costs. So um, right now you've got the, the basically the 30-30 split or the 50-50 split between property tax and sales tax. Again, if, if we look at it just longer term, we try to, to encourage a 50% goal for, for property tax. If you can get 50% of your general fund from property tax, that gets you really resilient in terms of sales tax and other things. So that assumption would mean that you're basically taking all of that 20% that's going to develop or coming from development fees right now and replacing that with property tax. Um, that's where that 2,000 per acre target number came from earlier. It assumes that 50% of your general fund comes from property tax, um, which may not be the case here. So to, to just to recap the options that we want you all to think about, um, you can get that additional revenue from sales tax or from property tax. Um, there's other there's other revenue there's other taxes or street fees or or other things that you might consider as well. But if you say sales tax, if you say we don't want to put any more burden on the property tax, we, we're comfortable with the property tax revenue that we have. We want to close that gap with sales tax. Then it's going to lead to that conversation about what kind of commercial do you want and where do you want it so that we can get that revenue. If you say we want property tax revenue, then there's really two choices there. There's the tax rate or there's the development pattern doing a higher value per acre development pattern that can get you more tax revenue without necessarily having to change the tax rate. Um, could be some combination of all those, but for tonight, what AJ is gonna focus on is we really want to hear kind of a priority and, and some thoughts on each of those different options um, so that we can kind of, that, that's gonna inform the growth strategy in the future land use map um, some as, as well. So um, I don't, I think that's kind of where, um, where I wanted to start that one and then kind of um, kick it over to, to AJ to run the first poll and then we'll have some discussion on it. I don't know if you want to have any questions from them before you get into the question. Or... Does anybody have any questions about those three sources before we kind of go into a 
Okay, let's try that. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, we'll make sure we have ten votes on each of these. So the question is, when development fees and increased tax revenue from growth are no longer available, what method do you believe to be the most effective in replacing it? Great, so we have answers coming in, and we'll give it a few minutes. We really should have some music to play during this part. Yes, <laughs> yes sir. I was thinking about that too. What is the increasing property tax revenues? I mean, is that cre creating more opportunities to collect or to, to collect tax and to yeah. fight yeah. revenue? Yeah, yeah. so, so one, one is sales tax. One is the tax rate, and then the third one is increasing the tax revenue from the development pattern. Okay, so it's opportunity-based. Correct. Okay, so we have nine votes. Ten votes. Okay, great. Good job, everyone. Did anybody have any problems oh, wow. voting on that one? Yes. Well, well uh, you know what you don't want, which is the third choice that is up there, so we've still made progress. <laughs> Good so let's let's talk about this for a minute. We've tried to structure this in a way where after each answer we can we can dig into this a little bit with you all because I, I'm, I think you can understand that whenever the staff is ready to bring you something for adoption, um, for you all to have a comfort level in adopting it, you need to know that it falls in line with some of your preferences, which is what we're trying to capture tonight. So split right down the middle on increasing property tax revenues and increasing sales tax revenues. Okay, so let's talk about that for a minute. Um, for those of you that uh, voted for property tax revenues, uh, any comments on why that was the option that you chose or why that sounded like the most effective option? Would anybody care to share about that? Please. I don't think it's black or white. I know you gave us three options. We can sure. only pick one, but you need to hedge on both sides because there's, when there's an increase in supply, then you have to you know, meet the demand. And, you know, we're dealing with that now with growth is providing opportunities for more sales tax to be collected by bringing in new businesses. So, mm -hmm. you know, those two things I don't think can be separated from one another that uh, if I could have responded with both, I would have. Okay. Understand. And, and understand we're, we're going to force you to make some hard choices tonight just because we want to see your initial inclinations. Uh, doesn't mean it's right or wrong. As Kevin mentioned in his presentation earlier, some of this is varying degrees of these things, and it's identifying where are the right places in your community. So for those of you that chose uh, increasing sales tax revenues as your answer, um, what were your thoughts there? Is that steeped in what you were just saying about retail opportunities and you want to see those increase? Did that lead you to answer more in that direction? Please. Um, my general hope is that the vibe will bring a whole bunch of new like development, um, mm -hmm. you know, businesses, and that will also there increase the quality of life, so you're able to like kind of get a, a good balance of both. Okay. Um, the, the, what I never want to see is there to be a dependence on property tax as far as homeowners, and you, unfortunately, there's not a division of property tax, right? It's all kind of the same. So if I had to choose between putting that tax burden upon somebody who owns homes or sales tax, it, it would be the sales tax. Okay, okay. So, so you understand how this factors into what we're going to be doing with the plan. So because we know that there's a high level of support for increasing sales tax revenues, one way you might see this uh, reflected in the plan that you get later is that we may look at your land use planning for the future and make sure that we're planning for more retail opportunities to help bolster this choice. So that's an example of how you might see this factor into the results later. I wanted to hear what you were going to say. I was say. just thinking most of the sales taxes will come from probably quality of life. If I want to, if I want to <coughs> like live here and pay my taxes, I want to spend my money um, purchasing goods or services in the area. Mm -hmm. I, I much rather paying the sales tax for that to be the increment other than coming from my property. Okay. Okay. And the leverage enough uh, what Daniela says, as we grow as a community, there's more and more inclination to spend within your yes. local within, community. Yes, and exactly. That's, and that's proven out. So, for example, I go to Costco down on, you know, but we're going to have a Costco soon. So. Yes, we are. Exactly. <laughs> that is one thing everyone seems to agree on is they're really excited about the Costco. Yeah. What were you going to say? Sir? Yes, ma'am. So, so, again, the mentality that we, we should always have is that, yes, we are residents, citizens, taxpayers, but we're also consumers. Mm -hmm. We are consumers yeah. every day. 
Yeah, I've said this many times before. Somebody right now is standing in line at Starbucks. Mm -hmm. Somebody right now is getting diapers at Walmart. Somebody right now is pumping gas at Red Basket. Mm -hmm. So that sales tax revenue is coming in, but we also don't want to be too dependent on it to where it's like that's all what we have right. for our general fund. Like exactly what he had mentioned earlier. We want to be able to utilize some of that money to where we're not always depending on it for our infrastructure and so forth. Here. We can put some of that aside, use it for, for the growth, whatever, but we don't want to be too dependent on that. Mm -hmm. we got to find other avenues and other ways to be able to... to That's a really good point. I'm glad you shared that. So, so to, to Kevin's point earlier and kind of uniting that with what you said, that is right. We have to think about in, in volatile times um, where things are a little unpredictable, which of these revenue sources remain steady, and that's property tax. The sales tax is going to fluctuate. Now, granted, um, oftentimes there are enough key indicators now that we can see some of those fluctuations before they happen, but I think one thing we all learned in COVID, we saw that many of our communities that we worked with that had a higher reliance on their property tax rate weathered that storm a little bit better. There was less volatility. Um, so you're right, it's going to be a careful balance, and I think, again, the 50-50 split shows that we need to try to figure out a balance that works for you all, um, especially because those sales tax revenues, you're, you're right, everyone is always spending, um, but earlier a couple of your residents talked about quality of life being so important to them, and so what we want to try to guide you to is a ratio that um, is not so overly dependent to your point on sales tax that you don't have room for the quality of life things because the sales tax is covering all the nuts and bolts and the the things that um, are really considered non-negotiables by your citizens and your sales tax can actually go towards some of those things that are more quality of life that are outside of that water wastewater public safety things the the fluffy things, the things that we really like that, that help us choose where to live. So I think that's some good dialogue that gives us some good direction that we need um, moving forward. So I'm going to move us on to... Um, so I, I just want to say two, two things real quick, just yes. as far as some history goes, because you, you're, you brought up the point of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So in 2020, the economy sort of stopped, and, and the city of Kyle didn't really see a, a big impact on our sales tax revenues. Mm -hmm. But the city of San Marcos saw their sales tax revenues uh, plummet by 25% in one year because they derived so much of their income from the outlet malls, which got shut down because of the pandemic. That's one. And, and I'm not trying to pick on San Marcos, but the other big, huge thing that happened in San Marcos a few years before that was a change in the, the law. Uh, the state made it so that if you are purchasing a, um, a uh, an online product you pay the sales tax is remitted to the city in which you, the, the, the consumer who buys it is as opposed to where it originated and they had the best buy call center which was originally routing in some of the in Amazon and a couple of those places that were originally routing tons millions of dollars of sales tax and if they were relying on that one vote of the legislature just cut away multiple millions of dollars worth of value right off of their budget so that's the volatility that sales Excellent. tax can, can produce and so and our sales tax have been just I mean, 15 million when I started here it was eight mm -hmm. so I mean it's just it's it's been very good but if you are over reliant and it's like within the sales tax uh, or is it some one big provider or some one big you know something that will if it is it's risky like the outlet mall or the Best Buy call center or is it sort of spread out over a lot of different businesses mm -hmm. so those are things to consider those are also good points to inform future land use planning as well. To your point, not all retail is created equal either. So that's right. another um, nuance that we should probably look at. Please. So that, that goes back to the consumer part. What is it that the necessities yeah. that we as a city, the services and products that we need or that we, we purchase, like the Mayor Mitchell's point was, those were all outlet centers, those were all distribution areas. but spreading it all out, bringing in businesses and companies, spreading it all out will help benefit that. Mm -hmm. So another thing just to, to think about, just to, to make sure um, to reinforce it, I'm sure you guys are probably aware of this, but just the relationship with how commercial works and you need a certain amount of residential to get that commercial right. And there's different <coughs> formulas for that based on the different businesses. Some have a bigger trade area and want to pull that population from a larger area like a Costco or, or big box of those. 
the more neighborhood commercial, the smaller you go, the more dependent they are on walkable traffic or for local neighborhood traffic. And one of the things that, that COVID showed and that we're seeing just post-COVID, again, is the kind of the quality of life in the neighborhoods. So there's more interest and it would be nice if we had that coffee shop like walkable distance from our, you know, from our home or something like, some more like the micro commercial but where do you put, you know, where do you put that? How do you integrate that into, into some of the, the neighborhoods? So that sales tax, like AJ said, it's, it can scale to really big stuff that it's big numbers, but it also, you, know, you want to make sure you balance that with a lot of other businesses again, so that if the way you shield yourself against that volatility is just more businesses of different types and sizes. So you don't want any legislation to knock you out. You don't want any certain geography to knock you out. You want to have that stuff spread out of different shapes and sizes um, so that anything that happens, hopefully we don't have another COVID, but if something like that happens, you, you have that um, that different mix to take advantage of it. So and residential and commercial. One, one more thing, I apologize. It's to Councilor Flores Kale's point about she doesn't want, she, she didn't want the burden to be on the homeowners. So like if you go back 10 years ago in the history of the city of Kyle, we were 95% single family residential as the only source of revenue for the city. So that number has come down dramatically over the last 10 years, and a lot of it is by design. But that's where commercial uh, real estate is very valuable because of the value that it brings in property taxes per acre, uh, as well as multifamily and townhomes and various other kinds. So you, it's a product mixture, I think, that creates the resiliency that we're trying to see. So that is the pursuit, at least. Mm -hmm. It's just not and that's easy a, that's to That's a great way to wrap it up. I appreciate that. Okay, let's move on to takeaway two. We still have quite a few questions to go through. So I'm gonna ask Kevin to kind of tee this one up for you. Keep this one pretty quick too. So this one gets at, um, when we look at a model and we say, okay, what do you need to pay for the streets? Um, if we look at it and say, oh, you've got 400, 500, $600,000 homes on small lots, it pencils. But the question is, that's not affordable to everybody. So. Part of what we're, we're thinking about here is getting it not necessarily the can the city pay the bills but can the people living here afford to stay here or move here so think about this in two ways you continue as is you say you know we like the way that we are um, we know that values are going to continue to to go up if you don't build that mix of housing it's going to drive the values of single family up um, if you're okay with that that's your priority. <coughs> if you do want to be affordable for more people what are those price points? What does that housing look like? Um, and again, there's there's options. It's it's definitely a, a little interesting twist here in Kyle with having a 1,800 square foot home going for 400 grand. That's most places we would say downsize the the single family to get to you know a 200,000 price point or something, and then anything under 200, you're looking at missing middle housing. But but here I think you're just you're looking you got to open up that whole spectrum of of housing, housing choices and, and think a little differently uh, there. So. so we're going to ask you a couple of questions. These are going to seem very difficult and, and you're not beholden to anything, okay? We just want to get kind of your initial thoughts and reactions. So in doing a little bit of research about your community, uh, what we found in, in the statistics is about 27% of the people that are Kyle citizens um, make less than $50,000 a year. This comes from census data. So the general rule of thumb when you're looking at house prices is that they are quote unquote, unquote affordable or within reach. Um, this is something that's widely <laughs> held in the banking community, for example. They look at a home price that's two and a half percent times your annual salary. So if we took that formula, which we're not here to debate, but just to use it to illustrate a point, this essentially means that 27% of your residents, based on that affordability formula, could afford home priced at or below $125,000, okay? So there's a lot of distance there. We're not gonna close it tonight, but just based on that, what percentage of the total home inventory in Kyle do you believe should be priced at or below $125,000 a year? Now, we've given you several different intervals here. Some of those intervals are below that 27%. Some of them are above that 27%. What we're trying to just get a feel for here is sort of your off the cuff, knee jerk reaction to what exactly are you looking for in terms of an affordable housing component to your housing inventory? So we're gonna give you a few moments to <coughs> go ahead and answer that survey question on your phone and then we're gonna talk for a minute about rental values. Okay. 
nice. We've got a couple of votes coming in. Great. So it looks like we've got six votes. We're waiting on four more. Okay. I feel like I'm in a baseball game watching one of those. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got a lot of variation here, um, which in itself is useful. So these things are all, there's always meaning behind all of these things. So it looks like about half of you are saying around that 21 to 30 percent mark is, is what, where we're looking at. Now I know some of you are probably thinking, okay, great, but how do you even make sure that homes come in at that price tag? So one of the points that Kevin's already made to you tonight and that we're going to continue talking with you about as we go through this planning process is the role of diversity of offerings. That's one of the ways you get there. It's not that any of us have the ability to wave the wand and make that $400,000 house. He just talked about plummet to a $150,000 price. That's just not within any of our reaches or we'd probably be applying that trade somewhere. Um, but this does bring a point that we need to start looking at and it looks like generally um, amongst this group, there is a tolerance for some diversity in, in housing offerings. That's a good piece of direction and gives us a little bit to run with. So let's turn this kind of in a different view and let's talk about it from the rental side. So just like with um, looking at affordability of housing, there is a similar rule of thumb for rent and that is that rent should not exceed 30% of your monthly income is the general rule of thumb. So based on what we just shared about that 27% component of your population in Kyle, that would mean that that subgroup of residents um, can afford to rent housing that's priced at or below $1,250 a month. So, similar question to you, same intervals. Based on that information, when you're thinking of rental inventory, again, taking into account that this could take many different forms besides single family, um, what allocation do you think we should look at for trying to hit that price point for that portion of your population? Okay, we got votes coming in already. Great. Okay, looks like we're... Is there any sort of about five more? stipulation on what... Is this for like one bedroom, two like wait? No, we're no? just we're just talking big picture at the moment. This will need to factor in for all of those different units. Okay, looks like we need two more votes. One more vote. Looks like we've got nine. We're looking for ten. Awesome. Okay, so similar to the last question, looks like we um, have a group that kind of falls all along that spectrum. It looks like the most support there is 11 to 20 percent, followed closely by the 21 to 30 percent. So that also gives us um, an area to kind of focus on. Now, to your point just a moment ago about different um, levels and different sizes of rental properties, that again is going to be an important area where we build in. Um, diversity in those offerings and understand I, I do want to make a quick point um, about the role of this plan in doing that and, and where you'll also have other tools that you'll need to use so the role in this comprehensive plan for you all is really setting that vision and capturing that for posterity and then the tools that your staff has to use and you to make decisions on like your zoning and development codes are where you really start to get at this so we're essentially trying to capture the big ideas and set the stage and cast that vision so that when you look at code updates in the future you're calibrating those tools to match the vision that you're trying to uh, to cast yes ma'am uh, I guess my question should have been before I answered that. Is that That's in okay. addition to the twelve hundred dollar uh, house people that can buy houses, or the hundred twenty five thousand dollar houses, and then and then this as well? Because I guess I was kind of mixing them together. Lumping it all together and that's totally fine and that's exactly how we were coming at the question. We'll need to get into some more fine tuning of this information. One of the things that you'll see in the final product that comes to you um, in the neighborhoods component is we'll really start breaking down different types of housing units um, and helping you understand the basics of those, how your codes need to enable those, um, what the characteristics of them are, and then providing you with guidance on where placement makes sense for those. So. You, you approached it exactly as we intended you to. 
Um, and so we'll be able to provide you with some choices, some guidance on how to apply those choices. And then as you're having these zoning discussions on individual requests, um, to a point someone made a little bit earlier, I think it was you made this point earlier about as you're having things come to you for consideration, you need to start having these conversations differently. And this will be part of, of what you were talking about earlier is having those conversations a little differently. So curious, was anyone surprised by that figure that almost a third of your residents were making $50,000 or less a year? Did that shock anybody? Okay, it was what everybody generally expected. Okay. So based on your vantage points as the PNZ and the city council, um, curious, we have just a couple more minutes before we move on to the next question, if there's any other sort of guidance um, or advice that you would ask us to consider as we start trying to prepare these things to bring to you in a plan form. Any concerns that you have, any frequent things that you hear from your constituents that you think we need to be mindful of? I think it's just the affordability okay. itself. Uh, but then again, the developers that come in, the home builders themselves, at what price point are we going to be looking at right. for these people to afford it? It's one right. thing. You know, we can say the 80,000 household, you know, maybe for, for the family itself, or maybe a little bit more than 100, but still, um, those are the things I guess we've got to really consider is that who is coming in, what type of, again, as a consumer, as a home buyer, <clears throat> what kind of product are we going to be able to have at that, at that price? Mm -hmm. Because you don't want to have anything also low end as well. Correct. That causes problems for the homeowner later on. You're absolutely right. And so the question will also be what kinds of that housing do you allow and have you made room for in your codes? And so that will be part of that discussion as well. So let's move on to takeaway three. We have several questions in this one um, that I'll ask Kevin to step up and tee up and then we'll kind of explain the next few questions for you. Okay, so <clears throat> this one gets back at that growth management. So where, when, how are you gonna grow? Um, if you say we want to be fiscally sustainable, we'll define what that is in terms of the math and your costs and all of, the, all of that. Um, but when we look at where do we put the growth, so we look at 10,000 or 20,000 or whatever your build-out population um, is, and we look at where to put those people in the city, um, there's two, two ways to look at this. One, like I mentioned earlier, is location. So if you want to prioritize putting more of those people into existing areas with existing infrastructure and vacant lots, um, if you want to there's usually two levels that we'll talk about there. So the first one is to, to put infill on vacant lots. That's the first bullet under location. And then the second one is look at anywhere that you have existing infrastructure. So your major roadways, your major water, sewer, sewer sheds, anywhere that you have the existing sewer trunk lines that has undeveloped land, you want to maximize that before you go build a new trunk line or a new pump station or pressure pressures on any of that stuff. So it, maximize what you have first before you build new. Um, and then when you build, this gets into the pattern question of what do you build? Are you building it in a way that addresses the affordability question? Are you building it in a way that addresses the value per acre question? Are you building it in a way um, that addresses the sales tax question? So there's different, we have a lot more ways we can build places now in terms of mix of uses and different scales, um, but we need to kind of know where you guys are on the to, to frame this another way, it would be, do you want more density in your downtown? Do you, do you want to add more people and kind of thicken up your core? Um, and that's going to be, if someone wants the higher density, more compact, walkable component, they're going to get it in the core of Kyle. Um, or do you want to build more newer mixed-use compact nodes? Maybe it's around the Vibe Trail. Maybe it's you know new development somewhere. There's different ways you can get that density as well. But just know if you do greenfield development, you're adding to that infrastructure price tag. So it just adds to more that you have to cover down the road. So where, we always say where, when, and how you add development has a direct relationship on what it costs to live in Kyle today and in the future. Okay, so we have a series of questions in this one and it's actually a series of graphics that we're going to show to you. So what we're looking for here, again, there are no right or wrong answers. We're just looking for your reactions to different levels of intensity. And with each different graphic, we're going to ask you, 
is this level of intensity something that you feel could be compatible in the community somewhere? We're not going to get into tonight where it should go and how it should look. Those are things that you all have already been discussing. We've been kind of following those conversations. Um, and they will be the subjects of additional conversations in the future. Uh, we will also be digging in, Kevin previewed this earlier, uh, on Wednesday as we're talking with the public. That's something that we, and we invite you all to come to those, uh, one of those sessions too. We're going to be looking um, in kind of a, a granular level at neighborhoods and figuring out where things should go. But for tonight, we're really just trying to understand your appetite for different levels of intensity around Kyle. So we start with the, the most open, and this is something that's probably very familiar to some of you. What I will note about the images that we're going to show you is they're all shown on the exact same tract of land in terms of size, okay? We're gonna continue to see this same tract of land split in different ways. So first, we want you to just take a look at this one, and then we want you to answer the question, does that level of intensity fit into the community character? Now you may say yes, absolutely, you may say no, absolutely, or you may say, you know what, in some circumstances it could, and we want to talk a little bit about what you think those circumstances are. Can we see it again? I... That's my <laughs> yes, there we go. Marshall, do you remember what the size of that track is? Is it 200 by 150? 200 by 150. Correct. So, so the, those yeah. lots there are 100 foot, 100 foot wide by 150 deep. So let's see where we are. Okay, so we're looking for three more votes. Okay, hmm. two more, one more. One more. I think Bear has a genuine concern that he is not voting with enough information. And I can kind of understand that too. <laughs> we're asking we're making for your big impressions. decisions. You're yeah, not this making is our any conflict. decisions. We're just asking for we your reactions. It's just, it's, I get it though. I get it. It's tough. I understand. I'm sorry for being the squeaky wheel, but we haven't had a comp plan since when? 2010. Yep. 2010. We haven't. We, well, we haven't had it up, updated. Uh, updated. Correct. So the point is, is for us to give you information that's helpful to write a new one. I don't. I could close my eyes and click a button. We just want to like know if you're comfortable with that helpful. in some way. But I'm not comfortable answering the question. Okay. Based on you don't have to answer the question. So it looks like uh, the majority of you say it could in certain circumstances. So let's talk about those circumstances for a minute. What are circumstances where that doesn't work? And Kyle? Well, okay. for home buyer that I know, uh, one of the things that she was telling me is that she loved her house, but she just hates mowing the grass. Okay, so maintenance okay. issues. Okay. Maintenance issues. Burden. Was, was, mm -hmm. her, was her issues. Uh, she wanted. She was always wanting to know because there any townhomes or condos that are going to be that they could buy. Okay. I actually heard it from another person that was saying that uh, when they moved from Colorado here, uh, that was the thing they have. We have nice yards and big lots, but again, it's it's the maintenance issue. Mm -hmm. Some people, some families are wanting the yards. I know in my neighborhood, everybody loves their yard. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it just depends on on, on the environment and the, the family that you're bringing and so forth on that end. But there are some people that I know that may want smaller lots. Some people may want townhomes or condos. So it's just a matter of, you know, it's not going to fit for everybody. Right. So that's, I understand. That's a very good way to say that. I understand what, what this is all about. Mm -hmm. It's just getting an idea, not saying that this is going to be set in stone. Correct. But just from what I've heard from people and seeing that, I can just... No route for that. It'll satisfy some of your residents. Some it won't be the right thing like for it. everybody. Some people mm -hmm. will. But that will be the That's view of it. You have cho choices, right? Yes. Like you can go and have and live in an apartment or in yes. a townhome because or you don't want to have to deal. If to it's for here. me, I could have two acres and cows in there and be happy. As I could. And I would love to remain in Kyle. <laughs> sure. Yes. While I have that. No, so what, what you've given us is great direction. Places. Okay. So I think it's if you're helpful. looking at an area like Button Creek that's totally not developed yet, that has large plots of land and it might be nice to go over there, I think kind of where Tobias's parents live, those are really large. I don't know if that's city limits or not. I drive by this area and I'm like, these houses Still are so working out on that cool. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> and, and, and some, so there is, I think, some spaces in Kyle mm -hmm. that can allow for that. Okay. And again, some people are going to want the density and the mm -hmm. walkability. I do, but I mean, yeah. maybe well, when I get older, I'm not going so to want to. So all I would yeah. say is that, you know, while I think everyone wants two acres and a farm, 
a two acre lot with city infrastructure and city services is a is a million and a half dollar property. So the amount of people who can afford it is less than one percent. Right. But the right. amount of people who can afford a two hundred and fifty to four hundred and fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollar home is everyone else. So is it appropriate for us to build out our infrastructure to try to attract less than one percent of people who can afford it? Is that even possible to do that? Or is it better for us to build out our infrastructure in such a way that it provides a really great opportunities for people to buy on smaller lots that can actually be afforded with great amenities and, and to a nice standard? So the question is a forced rank question. Mm -hmm. That's why for me, and I put no, it does not belong. Not because I don't think two acre lots are great, but mm -hmm. to get a two acre lot right now, you gotta go outside of town. And those are increasingly multiple million dollar lots but we have so, one acre lots coming well, and Toll Brothers, like it's, it's going to come. Those are million dollar homes. Exactly. Well, it's, but it's the point is to have a percentage. I right. think this will be a matter of like what percentage of this type of homes do we want to dedicate to right. that. Right. Well, that's a, that's You've given us two important directions, which is to, to try to solve the needs and desires of the people in your population. Yep and the means and the opportunity for them to afford those things. So I think those are two really solid pieces yeah, to of the direction. The point is to add this and, and then <coughs> to, to the next question, but there's, some of this also gives us a sense for neighborhood context, right? Those larger lots don't have to have the same level of infrastructure that a more suburban type neighborhood or a more dense neighborhood would have. You could have narrower streets and bar ditches. Well, it's not, like so, lots out on stagecoach. Yep. Like further so out, there's like some, some actual from subdivisions an infrastructure with standpoint, acre You lots. could put less infrastructure right. out there, and that kind of gets back to that quality of service, the, the Venn diagram, right, of the, the service standards of you're picking, you want that rural state. So you don't need curb and gutter and underground storm sewer and all that. You're okay with right. bar ditches and, and less infrastructure. Um, so there's variables, there's variables here, um, which brings down the service cost. It's not, it's not going to do as much about the value, the, the values are, and you just got to understand the, the baseline in Texas going forward is those values are going nowhere but up. So let's Fast. look at this next level of intensity and, and kind of get your thoughts about this one. So again, same size piece of property, this time it's split four ways. We have some different types of units that are shown there. Okay. So take a look at that one, and let's go ahead and. Can you can you go back? Yes. So because that was showing 5.8 units per acre. per acre. That that's an average. But what you're looking at here is each one of those homes is on a lot that's that's 50 feet by 150 feet. So let us know whether you think we currently have that could fit somewhere in Kyle. We currently have 4.7. Oh. In the peninsula? Mm -hmm. Ooh. We, that's what we currently have. So if, if we were to do this, then we're going to have more houses yeah. per acre. Okay, so we've got four votes so far. Five, six, seven. Everybody voted. She knows we're waiting on a couple more. Okay, she knows we're stuck at seven. Is anybody having trouble? I don't think it was me. <laughs> so it looks like the, I did it. the majority of you are saying yes. Um, that is something that can fit into the community character. There we go. Okay, great. So yes, it does. Okay. So that's a pretty that's a pretty decisive response. So we won't park on this one too long. Are there any concerns that you have about that level of intensity? With me, uh, I'll say I'm the middle. And okay. It has to do with certain circumstances. Like you were mentioning earlier. Yes. Okay. Because knowing being here mm -hmm. many many decades i just know the region mm -hmm. no I that's just, really important i just know the area you have to know who you're I serving know I've, I've, i it's the experience of, of living here knowing what areas are uh adequate for for these types of housing mm -hmm. what areas are areas where there are high floods mm -hmm. 
or areas where it's just the infrastructure itself. So understanding your city mm -hmm. in the layout of the city um, kind of got me to the where, you know, that those kind of lots would work in certain areas mm -hmm. and maybe some, some other areas it wouldn't. That's really helpful. And how much of that do we already have? Okay. Yes. Another great point. That's Because that's, like, yeah. I wouldn't want to just focus on this. I would like to know how much of this type of housing is currently in the area. Okay, so kind of understanding the diversity mix you have now exactly. and then how to add to that. Okay, that's have really Have you guys added that to the information yet? Because <coughs> I sorry? think that is an excellent point. It is, it, and we're taking notes of everything you've given us. I think that's a great piece of direction for us to look at, so thank you for that. You guys are giving us some good stuff here. Okay, let's look at the next one. This is bumping it up another level of intensity. So again, same size property, but now we're splitting it up in, into uh, allowing more units and we've allowed some different types of units here. So you see more of a variety of housing mix. So think about that for a moment and let me open up the question here. Again, does that level of intensity fit somewhere into your community's character? We got two votes, four votes, five, man you guys are fast now, six. Eight. Looking for two more. You can just count me out. So don't, <laughs> just don't, don't wait on me, okay? Okay. So, uh, so we have a little more disparity here. So we've got some affirmative, yes, absolutely it does. Some absolutely not. And some, yes, it could. So let's, let's talk about the no, it does not for a minute. Does anybody want to share why you might be just say completely there's not a place for this in Kyle? And I'll go back to the picture so we can kind of look at that as we're talking. Anybody want to comment on that? Anybody want to comment on why they think decisively, yes, it does fit somewhere in Kyle? I can. Yeah. Please. Sure. I'd be happy to. Please. So for, uh, for one, home ownership and affordability is the question that we keep talking about, right? And so if we're saying that... Uh, uh, only certain types of lots are going to be allowed in the community, then only certain types of incomes are allowed to purchase in the neighborhood. So by allowing for additional dwelling units in the back, for example, you can have an additional income stream to allow for someone to purchase a unit that they might not, not otherwise be able to. Basically, just it brings down the cost of the units to make it more affordable. To me, the goal should be to make it such that the median income in the city of Kyle is, a, is able to have a good amount of property that they can purchase and achieve the American dream in the city of Kyle. And if we are not allowing our development patterns to allow for homes to be put on the market for sale and in a way that is attainable by the average person who lives here, then we are contributing. Uh, to the uh, unaffordability crisis in the city. So uh, I would rather, I think we should be trying to figure out, and it's like, I don't know how to do this because uh, the rental situation, but like townhomes, for example, you should be able to buy townhomes yes, for $250,000 and you, and that's on just, you're, you got, you're sharing a wall with someone, but you're, you're able to get into the American dream. A single teacher, you know, with the kid could, should be able to get a two bedroom townhome uh, and, and, and actually make that purchase, whereas they cannot make a $450,000 home <coughs> purchase without getting married and, and so, doing all kinds of things, and maybe even then they yeah. can't. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's, that's what the yes is For this final five, mother-in-law, don't want mother-in-law in the house. Mother-in-law can't really be somewhere else, so the ADU is a good solution for that. It's close, but not in the same and now no. we all know how Kevin feels about Smith right now. <laughs> so to that point, I'm calling it right now. <laughs> we need to be limited instead of the building of the dwelling to make it actually to be purchased instead of a rental. Well, you can't really legislate rental versus owner, but what you can legislate is product type. So condos, townhomes, uh, mm -hmm. you know, single family with an ADU, those are all product types that, you know, should be available for purchase, but they aren't all. That goes to the point I made earlier with the two that I've had conversations with. It's this person that I work with, again, who wanted to buy a home. She bought a home in Emberwood, but it was just her by herself. She was a female officer. 
couldn't take care of it, you know, because it was just too, it was just a lot. Yard, maintenance, roof, whatever it is. Versus having a townhome, which you mentioned. Because if there was townhomes there that I could buy, that'd be perfect. And then also the retiree that I spoke to that came to Colorado, uh, her grandkids are here, and she's not, she's lived on the big farm, big house, did all that, uh, and wanted to find something to where it's, like you said, sustainable, but it, she could still be able to purchase it, but not have to have the, the big yard, and just having that diversity. I, I will say, if we're talking about affordability, I don't know if it's necessarily fair to say, well, if you want a $125,000 house in Kyle, this is what you have to live in, mm -hmm. right? So my hope for affordability is we don't have to cram everybody in yeah. and treat them. For me, I mean, some people do want that, and I, and I understand that. But if you want to have a little bit bigger yard or a standalone home and you don't have neighbors whose walls that you can touch, I feel like you should be able to have that too. So that wouldn't be a reason that I would okay. want that kind. You know, I think, again, like you said, there's a mother-in-law. There's some people who genuinely enjoy it. Mm -hmm. They just like being that close, but not everybody does. But based on affordability, I would like to see more than just that. Okay. So let me ask a, another question off of the slide. So as you can see on the slide, we have not only smaller lots, but we also have different types of housing units. So I'm curious what you all think um, about the different types of housing units. And if, if you were a little, um, if you had a little bit of objection to this particular image, help us understand, was it more about the different types of housing units or was it more about the size of the lots? It's that would help us a lot. I, I don't, I would say probably the size of the lots, like Plum Creek okay. has an example that there are um, streets that have bigger lots and then there is townhomes in another street. Mm -hmm. uh, so having the different types of units in, in one same development will make sense to me. Okay. So, so and I'm curious to extend that, based, based on your constituents, based on the people in your community that you know, do you think that that is representative of what most people in Kyle think? Do you think they would be more open to different types of houses in the same area but might need more convincing and persuasion on smaller lots? Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I think that's is that fair to yeah, say. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I want to make sure we understand. Probably the compromise here is like, and it was so kind of what Laura Lee was talking about with <coughs> parks. So if you have, you know, an acre and you want to create a lot more density, if you just fill the acre up with houses, there's no green space or park or amenity. That, and so, but if you uh, if you create even more density, but leave half of that acre for a public park, then the people who live on one half can enjoy that amenity, which is Plum Creek. Right. That is what Plum Creek does. It allows for a lot of green space that's privately owned and maintained through an homeowner. It's not public. It's not like the it's not a burden on the taxpayers but it's the people who live there. So the, the density is on one side, but the amenities are there as well. So to me, that should be- It feels different, right? right that, should be the, that should be the goal, okay. is to create density of housing, but also to allow for there to be a lot of amenities within that type of- That's uh, that's really helpful. And I saw some of you nodding. Every single acre. I think it's a goal. Of, I don't know if it has to be <clears throat> the goal. Sure, sure. Yeah. But it seems like a lot of you were nodding in consensus that you feel, you know, this density might feel different if it was placed close to open space, that there might be less opposition to it with those types of things. And okay, that's really useful for us to and have. That, that shows the diversity of this council where, where people live. Mm -hmm. The experience is that some people live in that area and they understand the concept where sure. some people live in areas where they, we've got big lots. Right. Which it's ironic because yeah. when we talk about density, yeah. we talk about the west side, we talk about Palm yeah. Creek, but a lot of the subdivisions on the east side are larger lots. Exactly. But they have. Well, what do they complain about? Yeah. There's no amenities There's no in amenities. east side, right? So it's mm -hmm. you have so to consider the opportunity the cost and the trade-off for absolutely. How you know. Well, and you 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 bring up an important point that that kind of ties into what Kevin was sharing with you all earlier. When the land that you've developed is much more productive, you can allow for more of that green space that isn't generating so much property tax revenue. So it's this balance that we were talking about. Okay, let's look at one, let's step this up one last time and let you take a look at that and, and see what you think. I'm sorry, we have two more. This is the next to last one. So here and again, we've got that same tract of land. It, it's in smaller lots than the last one. We have, again, different types of housing units. And there's more trees, but we didn't do that on purpose. 
So take a look at that one and let us know what your thoughts are on that one. Does that level of intensity fit somewhere for Kyle? <laughs> Okay, we've got two votes. This thing doesn't. Does it not like you? There, it there you go. I didn't see the photo. Sorry. Sure. Let me go back. There you go. I can see yourself. <laughs> Let's see where we're at. We've got six. Looking for two or three more votes. Seven, looking for a couple more. Eight, one more. Okay, so it looks like um, most of you said yes in certain circumstances, okay? Um, and then we have some on both sides of yes it does, no it does not. So let's, let's start with talking about those certain circumstances. And some of it's probably what we just talked about to some degree, so that's okay if, if that is the answer. But are there any other thoughts on circumstances where this would work versus circumstances where it might not? Oh, I apologize. There we go. Yeah, I think again, close to a green space or mm -hmm. park, then this is... So this context is, is really that's, critical. That's right. That's okay. Right. It's, it's hard to take it just as a block without knowing what's around mm -hmm. it, you know. Of course. It probably doesn't belong belong like a, a mile out on Bunton, mm -hmm. you know, sure. but as far as like right next to a, a regional node, you know, like right next to shopping and park space, that's mm -hmm. probably more where okay. I would say. And when you're looking at this mix of different housing units, how do we feel about the fact that they're mixed on the same block? Does anybody have an objection to that? What I does that mean? Like, what do you mean it's mixed on the same block? Different, different sizes. So it's on the same oh, block and you have lots of different housing types? I know with traditional zoning, we're used to seeing those things separated and spread apart, right? We used to... This is the traditional way that we used to develop. We do so. more PUD zoning requests now right. because of the homogeneity of the developers. They want to put 350-foot lots all right next to mm -hmm. each other, and uh, we've been pushing back on that to try to have more diverse, diverse okay. communities through the years. So as a, as a model of, of the, like on Plum Creek, but not, it's not just Plum Creek. There are other, other developments where... Some single family. You want to be able to like move up within the development. Right. It's always, always You're building neighborhoods, not building, subdivisions. Yeah, build communities. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Does I, it, I, I see some nodding. Does everybody pretty much concur with that? Okay, please. I think so. <laughs> from the developer side, mm -hmm. that's a very difficult block to. They do not like it. Developers yeah. do okay. not like it. Very difficult to plot and to to execute. Mm -hmm. um, I like the mix, so you know, one block can be a product, and the next block can be mm -hmm. a product. Uh, but this is that would be very difficult to develop, especially where you have, um, I mean, the prevalence of homeowners associations just looking at duplexes, those kind of look like motor courts, the, the pink ones, mm -hmm. um, with some shared drives. I can't, can't really tell. There's also the, you know, the thought of, A, building this all at once from Greenfield Development versus yeah. going into an existing neighborhood and adding some of this density. So what are your thoughts on those two? I think your front half is pretty easy to develop. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about more the, the rears. Okay. It's pretty difficult. I mean, Mueller does this. They have single family next to a duplex. Mm -hmm. Did you take a drive up there? Is it just because there's the, the density wow, of it? Or? No, it's just platting it out. all but, different kinds of Yeah. That. And, that's and a great area. It, it's just you difficult. You really should go. Yes. yes. That would be great for you guys. Okay, let me move us on. We're getting short on time, so I want to make sure we stay on track. Okay, so now we've stepped up the intensity just another level. So here we are again looking at some, some higher levels of intensity um, in this particular block. So take a look at that. That's R33 zoning in Kyle, by the way. 30 units per acre. Right here? That's multifamily zoning. This one? Right. Yeah, it, we don't have a zoning that looks like that. No. So, but our multifamily zoning is 30 years. That's the closest thing to what you have now. R33. Okay. Yeah. Can I say one quick thing about this one? So just to give you guys like a tiny bit of context about what you're looking at here. Um, I do think it's important, the dwelling units per acre that you see on all of these, in this particular instance, are net dwelling units per acre. They are not designed to like give you an actual decision-making uh, yeah. piece of data. It's just to be able to compare 
from one visual to the next. And net means that you don't factor in the streets, you're just talking about the, the private property. So um, I would encourage you guys not to get too hung up on the dwelling units per acre number. Second thing about this one is, you were saying that you have existing zoning that will get you 30 units per acre. Well, this is a neighborhood context that would technically make 30 units per acre possible, but it doesn't look like an apartment complex because of the way that it's done. The one second from the top, that's a 12 unit uh, small multiplex, which is about the smallest you know, apartment complex one can build in a, uh, excuse me, the largest apartment complex one can build in a neighborhood context. So the way that you get at this high number here is by allowing for um, a higher building typology inside a neighborhood context. So just for a little bit of clarity, like you see a uh, single family home in the bottom corner, you see homes with ADUs at the top, uh, the yellow one in the front it would be a quadplex, and the one in the back is a single unit ADU. So just so you understand what it is you're seeing on the screen here. So where would we see apartments like this inside a neighborhood like that? Like is there an example that you guys know of that we can kind of look at? The, uh, they have 12 places in, in, at the Miller Development in Austin, you can see there's not a whole lot of them. And, and to be clear, just about all of these things that you're seeing, nobody here is suggesting that we want you to build any one place in Kyle to look exactly like these blocks. What we're trying to ascertain from each of you is, if there was a block in Kyle that looked like that, would that be a problem? Would this be unacceptable everywhere? Um, so. And, of course, people have said no up to this point. That's a perfectly acceptable answer. But yeah, you can see 12 plexes. Uh, Miller is full of five plexes. They've got lots of quads and attached townhomes that are done in uh, deep lot format. So you basically have all of the entries along the side. And there's an alley down. So from the front, it looks like a singly masked house. You still have eight <coughs> units in it or something like that. So there's a lot of diversity there. So I really would encourage you guys to check it out because it's so close. Mm -hmm. I, I wish the question was, would you rather see this as opposed to multifamily well, zoning? Well, answer because that question for us. if you put that in us. the context, it's like if you <laughs> Answer just, that question for us. What's that? Your question. Let's, let's talk about that. Would you prefer this over apartments? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. No, I, I'd like to hear what you all think about that. Yes. I'm seeing some nods. Yes. That's a, that's okay. a question I can get on board with. Okay. I would say yeah. yes to that Okay. Question. Great. Thank you. Okay. It's the same. It's the same intensity, but it's a whole different. Type it's a different of way of getting of, there. Of lifestyle. Very different way of getting there. And you guys have already had so many conversations about the way you're wanting to curate Kyle to look and feel. So this is this is really in keeping with your line of thought there. So you've reached the end. Congratulations. <laughs> you made it. You all did a great job voting, and so we have about. 13 minutes left. Again, we want to be respectful of your time and let you go when we promise, but we have a little bit of extra time. So, reactions after you've thought through this a little bit. Concerns that you have moving forward, things that you would like us to know um, that you haven't gotten to share up to this point. We'd love to hear all of those things. I'm a little concerned that uh, we're thinking about imposing high density on new, new incoming residents, whereas existing residents have a, you know, generally average larger lots or more green space or what have you so um, I think we need to keep keep that in mind okay. as we go do you but, think but, that the ladder those is houses more... are already here like, like, <laughs> you, you can buy that house that house right, is for yes. sale in like every neighborhood you know you can go buy that you know a new person doesn't have to buy the new development um, an existing resident can move to that new development Absolutely. Uh, what I want to see is we don't have enough of that diversity. We have too much of the same. Yes. And we were talking earlier about the, you know, we want 10%, 20% to be affordable for that $50,000 a year person. Well, we don't have much of that now. So it's not that what we create needs to be 10%. We need to create enough of that to the, where the whole aggregate is that amount. That's going to take a lot. If we want to make Kyle affordable for that percentage of that person who makes that amount of money, we need to make quite a bit of that. And we don't have it yet. So if the person wants the larger lot, you know, you can buy a house that's already here. We need more of the houses that they can afford. And rather than imposing, the question that keeps coming to my mind, being in the middle of this, because we've got developers out there right now talking about us, and about Kyle, and we've got people thinking about moving here. How, how do we incentivize these parties to match Kyle that we're thinking about, you see? I mean, how do we get the developers to come in to build what we're talking about? 
<laughs> the, I think they I think they would, but we don't allow for that kind of density right now very often. But the trade-off is, and what I think the fear is, is that if we allow for that, the, the it's so overwhelming. It's like, what about the quality? Because if you do one big 12-plex and that's not actually a good quality structure, then it can go downhill in a hurry, and then you've got a blight situation. Mm -hmm. So if what, if what we're saying is we'd like to see this density, then perhaps the, the right approach is to uh, require design and development standards to make sure that when they come with that kind of, it's like, because developers want the density. They absolutely do. And if they come and say, hey, we want density, then our response should be, well, we want quality. So if you bring, in, it's, as opposed to fighting them on density, which is, I think, what we often try to do, is we say, no, we're not going to let you have 30 units. We're going to let you have 20, which we've seen today sort of arguing against our own financial best interest. But rather than say, no, it's got to be 20, it's we need, a, we need a pocket park or we need you to use full masonry or we need you to use, you know, like, you know, composite shingles or, you know, those kind of, you know, those kind of things. That's a really, really important point is to understand the bigger picture of how what we're doing today fits into what you're all saying, right? And there's a lot of work between here and there, but you all seem like you're really poised to do it. So this is really step one, right? The, the comprehensive plan is really here to, to establish the vision for the community and to let those developers and your community members and others that are interested in Kyle understand what you're trying to create and how you want to get there. And then when this plan is finished, that's when the heavy lifting really starts for you all in terms of, okay, how do we make those design standards work and, and execute that vision that we just adopted? How do we make codes that truly accomplish getting those things that we set, making it easier to do the right things that you all have laid out in this plan? So, um, you know, this will be a marathon and not a sprint, and, and our piece of this is small, um, but it sounds like you all really have already come to some place of consensus on the vision of what you're looking to do. Um, and so to your point about how do we incentivize people to come in and do that, you know, your codes are going to be a big part of this discussion. Um, I know that we've, some of the background we've done on you all, you've already had some of these conversations where you've said we want to update our codes and we want to get these things right. So you're thinking about all the, the right things and having this, this piece as sort of the launch path for that to happen will be very helpful. You've given us some really good insights. Any others? So back to the affordability piece, mm -hmm. I'd be interested, where, where did the data come from? Is that census data? Is that from the census data. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming we don't have enough to drill down to say, okay, what percentage of those are current owners? We don't. Okay. We don't. Because I would bet a good percentage of those are current legacy owners within the community. Right. So now you're looking at that percentage of, okay, 27% oh, might knock down to 12%, 13% that currently don't, do not own. That might be the case, sure. And, and really what we were trying to do there is not so much, you know, focus on that specific figure is to just say, there's a large population here that needs a different type of housing and, and how do you feel? And I think you've given us some very clear direction on how you feel about that, how you want to address that. So I'm sure we could probably pick apart that figure a little bit, but it was really just to drive home the point that there's a presence. Of, and you all said, we're not surprised by this number. So you already kind of knew that. Yeah, and then on the opposite end of that, the new folks moving in, do they fall in that same Yeah, we don't, have, we don't have that data, but... I don't know how everybody else feels, but I know I would like to see that affordability spread throughout Kyle mm -hmm. and not just... Not in pockets, a yes. yeah. certain part yeah. of town. Right. Yeah. right. Another important point for us to consider moving forward. You all have been great. Thank you so much for your time and attention and participation, your clear direction. It really helps us set up a product that we can bring to you that will be in line with your expectations. Um, and we'll hang out for a few extra minutes if you want to visit, but I do want to make sure that we get you out of here as promised. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Oh, you guys as well. I'm going to adjourn. Sorry. There you go. We are adjourned. Always happy to see you guys. <laughs>